Good afternoon and welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board. My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Board, and I will call this meeting to order. Um, I will start with the Executive Director's Report, and I will fill in for Susan Barrett to uh, deliver that. Um, the first thing that I want to announce is that posted on our uh, website are letters that we sent to both um, UVM Health Network and to urging the parties to come to agreement. It's shameful that um, 1,800 Vermonters are being held hostage um, through this negotiation, and we're hopeful that the parties will come to, to terms or at least agree to an extension so that they continue to negotiate. So those letters have gone out. Um, also on our website, um, we have, uh, you can find the link to give public comment on hospital budget guidance. Um, that will be open until March 21st, next Monday, and will be extended if we don't uh, um, vote on guidance um, on Wednesday the 23rd. We also have the open public comment uh, regarding um, the next agreement that has been on the site, and um, that is there as well. Um, the next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, March 9th. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, March the 9th, without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please signify by saying nay. Let the record indicate that the motion passed unanimously. Um, next on the agenda, is uh, a discussion on Clover Help, and we will turn it over to Marissa, Russ, uh, Julia, Patrick, and Michelle. And Marissa, I'll ask you to tee it up. Great, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, everyone, members of the board. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. visible for everyone? Yes, it is, Marissa. It's all set. Great. Thank you. So again, uh, good afternoon. Uh, we're here today to share with you our staff analysis and recommendations on the FY22 budget submission for Clover Health Partners. My name is Marissa Melamed. I'm Associate Director for Health Systems Policy with the Green Mountain Care Board. And I have with me several members of our team to help present today, Russ McCracken with the legal team, Julia Bowles and Michelle Sawyer with our policy team, and Patrick Rooney with our finance team. So this is the agenda for today. Uh, Russ is gonna start by reviewing the board's authority and criteria for the review. Julia and I are gonna give you some relevant background information and an overview, uh, the elements of the budget review um, consists of both uh, policy and finance. So we will, we'll, um, different members of the team are gonna talk about different aspects of that. Um, we're gonna present to you our staff recommendations as we go, uh, and then we'll finish with a summary of the staff recommendations, uh, turn it over for board questions and discussion, an opportunity for public comment, and then next steps. So I'm gonna turn it over to Russ for the next couple of slides. Hey, thank you, Marissa. Um, I'm going to start by framing the regulatory process that the, ha the board has for this type of ACO. Um, broadly, the board's overview and regulation of ACOs is made up of two different processes. The first is certification, and the second is an annual budget review. Uh, certification is only required for an ACO to be eligible to receive payments from Medicaid or commercial insurance. Uh, that requirement is set by statute. And as Clover Health receives neither, uh, the question of certification um, for Clover Health is not before the board. So, in other words, the board is not <clears throat> sorry. The board is not asked to decide if Clover Health may operate in Vermont. Uh, under the statute and the rule, the board annually 
reviews and modifies or approves ACO's budgets. Uh, that aspect of the statute and rule do apply to Clover Health. Uh, next slide, Marissa. <clears throat> uh, the budget review under statute and rule uh, is different depending on whether an ACO has more or less than 10,000 attributed lives in a budgeted year uh, in the state. Clover Health is well under that 10,000 attributed lives threshold. Uh, and so we have a, we follow a particular process um, for them that differs slightly from other ACOs. Um, it's the first instance of an ACO that is Medicare only and less than 10,000 lives uh, before the board. So staff developed specific guidance for this type of ACO um, that was then reviewed and approved by the board uh, last year. Um, regarding the scope of the board's jurisdiction, there, there are two points that I wanted to note here. Um, first is that the parameters and terms of the, the uh, CMS direct contracting model uh, and its replacement CMS's ACO reach model uh, are set by the federal government. And the second point is that the board and Vermont statute govern conduct in Vermont and can't govern conduct that's either directly or by practical effect uh, that is outside of the state. There's case law that delves into the nuance of both of these points, but uh, I will, for purposes of this discussion, leave uh, just those general statements. Um, also to note here that in addition to the budget review, the board can require uh, an ACO to report certain data and analysis. That's part of the board's authority under Rule 5501. Um, and lastly, I, as the board uh, is familiar, but um, as a, a kind of public refresher, the procedural history here, um, Clover Health requested a waiver of the budget review process in 2021. Um, it was reviewed by the board in 2021. Uh, the board declined that last summer. The staff developed some guidance for Medicare only ACOs with fewer than 10,000 lives, uh, which the board reviewed and approved in 2020 in October, rather. And Clover Health's budget was submitted uh, December 31st of 2021. Uh, next slide, Marissa. <clears throat> um, this is the uh, this is an excerpt from uh, the board's ACO oversight rule. It's rule 5405 part C, and it applies to ACOs that have fewer than 10,000 attributed lives in Vermont. Um, we have here four criteria that the board will take into consideration. Um, what I wanted, what we wanted to focus on here in particular is Part two, the bold and highlighted aspect is that differs from the board's review for ACOs that have more than 10,000 lives. Um, the board can select the criteria from 18 BSA 9382 that the board deems appropriate to the ACO size and scope. And on the next slide, we have some staff suggestions about which criteria uh, the board should Focus, which of the statutory criteria the board should focus on um, for Clover Health in light of their uh, size, presence, and scope of their operations in Vermont. Um, I won't read through all of these here, but um, generally it's information regarding utilization of the health care services, um, the effect of the care model on appropriate utilization, and uh, the provision of innovative services character, competence, fiscal responsibility, and soundness of the ACO, reports from professional review, review organizations, or <clears throat> the ACO's efforts to prevent duplication of care um, and integration with the Blueprint for Health and its regional care collaboratives. As continues on to the next slide, uh, the board would consider public comment from information that's gathered from meetings with the ACO, uh, information on the ACO's administrative cost, um, the extent to which the ACO makes its cost transparent and easy to understand, uh, 
the extent to which the ACO provides resources to primary care practices to ensure uh, care coordination and community services are delivered to patients. Um, and I think that we, throughout this presentation, um, these are the kind of overall criteria and factors that we've tried to um, focus on in presenting presenting the information here. Um, <clears throat> so what's, there are 16 criteria in 9382. What's not listed here generally are, are factors that staff thought, given the limited size and scope of Clover Health's operations, at least for the current year, um, was less important to focus on. There are uh, additionally some factors that were not applicable, such as the effect of Medicaid reimbursement rates. Um, I do want to note that in the factors not listed here that the staff haven't um, focused on, there are some uh, valuable population health initiatives um, and systemic health care investment uh, criteria. But our view was given that Clover's presence is limited to one practice and roughly 1,800 aligned beneficiaries. And given that it's operating within the scope of a established Medicare, um, or a, a, the scope set by Medicare for its ACO model, uh, the staff felt that that wasn't as essential a factor to, to consider this year. Um, I do think it's worth noting, and we'll get into it a little bit further on with respect to those factors, that uh, the direct contracting model is being replaced with an ACO reach model um, that may help address uh, some concerns in that area. Uh, so with that, uh, Marissa, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Russ. I'm going to start with a high level overview of uh, what we're talking about. Uh, what is Clover? What is direct contracting? Um, we did introduce, um, you know, the entity and the concepts back when the board reviewed or, uh, you know, reviewed their initial request in June. Um, but we want to make sure we're clear what we're talking about here. So um, Clover Health is participating in the Medicare direct contracting or DC model. Uh, and the, uh, the DC model builds on the next generation ACO model with several new uh, model design elements. Uh, and its intention is to bring more Medicare payments from fee for service into value based payment arrangements through two voluntary risk sharing options. So the model was originally slated to run from 2021 through 2026. However, it was announced late in February. Uh, that the model as it uh, is currently operating will end uh, at the end of, of this year, 2022, and transition to the ACO REACH model starting in 2023. And we will talk about that uh, a little bit more. The risk model under the DC uh, uh, agreement um, is that the DCE or the direct contracting entity bears full upside and downside risk or, or the, the, the risk model that they are operating under. And um, it is a higher risk than we see in our other ACO arrangements. Um, who is involved? So the agreement is between uh, CMS and the direct contracting entities and then providers who contract with DCEs. So this is not uh, a, a change to um, members' Medicare uh, enrollments or it's not Medicare Advantage. Uh, it's uh, a DCE is uh, essentially the same thing as an ACO. It just was renamed in this model, and in the ACO Reach model, these entities will again be known as ACOs. Uh, Clover Health Partners is a multi-state direct contracting entity that has contracted with Vermont providers. They agree to be accountable for the cost and quality for aligned beneficiaries. Uh, and the providers have access to the Clover Assistant, which is a point of care tool offering clinical support and other capabilities. So that, as Clover presented, that is uh, a value add that, that they um, th say that they bring to the providers. So we felt it was important to understand the impact on Vermonters who are aligned to this model. Again, the agreement is not, it, it doesn't change um, uh, Medicare beneficiaries, uh, you know, uh, agreement or, or contracts with Medicare. This is an agreement between the direct contracting entity and Medicare. However, beneficiaries are aligned 
um, to this model, uh, similar to uh, ACO alignment and other models. Um, the beneficiaries who are aligned to the DCEs are still in traditional Medicare. Um, they have access to the entire traditional Medicare network. Uh, the alignment to the DCE does not affect their out-of-pocket costs and premiums, except in the case of some um, benefit enhancements on cost sharing, which, which we'll mention. Um, but it does not uh, change their, you know, their premiums and out-of-pocket costs or their contract with under their Medicare uh, traditional Medicare uh, agreement. It does not affect the use of supplemental insurance. Um, DCE attributed beneficiary rights in the DCE participation agreement include beneficiary notifications uh, that they are aligned, uh, beneficiary freedom of choice, and the rights to opt out of data sharing. Again, this is uh, similar to other ACO arrangements that we review. Um, and in addition, as I mentioned, through, through the DCE uh, providers, the beneficiaries may have access to additional uh, benefit enhancements. Um, including coordinated care between the DCE participating providers and preferred providers um, and access to benefit enhancements, which we will touch on a little bit, a little bit more. And again, this is uh, not a Medicare Advantage. Clover Health, the parent company, does operate Medicare Advantage plans, but Clover does not offer Medicare Advantage plans in Vermont. We wanted to highlight for you the public reporting and transparency. This is lifted directly from the direct contracting model participation agreement. Uh, we, since there, you know, our recommendations are going to center around reporting, we want to make sure it's clear what they're already required to publicly report and post on their website. Uh, name and location of the entity, primary contact information, identification of all DC participants and preferred providers um, by state, identification of all joint ventures between or among the DCE and any of its DC per participant providers and preferred providers, identification of the DCE's key clinical and administrative leaders and the name of any company by which they are employed, identification of members of the DCE's governing body and name of any entity by which they are employed, and uh, public reporting includes shared savings and shared loss information, uh, including the amount of any shared savings or shared losses for any performance year, the proportion of shared savings invested in infrastructure, redesigned care processes, and other resources necessary to improve outcomes and reduce Medicare costs for beneficiaries, and the proportion of shared savings uh, distributed to DC participant providers and preferred providers. Um, and the final one is the DCE's performance on the quality measures described uh, in the agreement. And uh, uh, Clover does have the information that is currently available uh, posted on their website. They've also submitted uh, this information to us. However, uh, um, shared savings and loss information, quality um, performance, those uh, that's not available yet. I want to make a quick note on integration with the Vermont All Payer Model Initiative. Uh, just a couple of things to keep in mind. The DC model participants or sorry participants in the DC model so the uh, participant providers cannot also participate in the Medicare shared savings program or other Medicare shared savings initiatives uh, basically you can participate in one Medicare uh, program but not multiple so participants in uh, the clover program cannot also participate in the Vermont Medicare ACO initiative and a staff analysis uh, determined that Clover Health Partners Program in Vermont is unlikely to qualify for all payer model scale. I'm going to turn the next couple slides over to my colleague, uh, Julia Bowles, who looked into information about the ACO REACH model, and she's going to talk you through those talking points. Sure. Yeah, thank you, Marissa. So as Marissa and um, Russ noted, the, the um, DCE model is, is undergoing a redesign. This was just announced um, just less than a month ago. So I think everyone is still sort of digesting, but we wanted to make sure to give some of the high points. Um, so CMS announced that they were redesigning the DC model in response to administration priorities and feedback from stakeholders. 
Um, the new model is called the ACO REACH model, as you've heard, and REACH stands for Realizing Equity, Access, and Community Health. So this new model does retain many of the same features as the current DC model, but with an added emphasis on advancing health equity, promoting leadership and governance, and protecting, or sorry, promoting provider leadership and governance and protecting beneficiaries through more monitoring. And current DCEs can transition to the new ACO REACH model so long as they remain in good standing with CMS, as well as agree to meet the requirements of the ACO REACH model by January 1st of 2023. And as Marissa mentioned, entities that are currently referred to as DCEs will be called REACH ACOs under this new model. Um, so again, this was just announced in February, but if we can go to the next slide, we wanted to just hit some of the um, key changes that we felt were relevant to what we're going to be reviewing for the rest of this presentation. Um, I do want to flag that at the bottom of this slide, there's a link to a CMS chart that in more detail than this slide walks through many of the granular changes to the model. Um, but the ones that we wanted to highlight are listed here. So first, the model updates the ACO governance requirements. Under the DC model, participating providers have to hold at least 25% of governing board voting rights. Under the ACO REACH model, the percent will be increasing to 75%. And this new 75% number probably sounds familiar to folks because it aligns with the governance requirements in the Vermont Medicare ACO Initiative Participation Agreement. And additionally, under the ACO REACH model, beneficiary and consumer advocates have to hold voting rights, and these members also have to be separate. They cannot be the same person. So secondly, there is an added emphasis on health equity through new requirements and benchmark adjustments. So specifically, ACOs must develop a health equity plan and collect beneficiary reported demographic and social needs data. Also, there is a new health equity benchmark adjustment that has been added to better support care delivery and coordination for patients in underserved communities. And lastly, under the health equity section, there is a new there are new benefit enhancements that are being added to increase the range of services that may be ordered by nurse practitioners to improve access. And as Marissa mentioned, we will be going into more detail on the benefit enhancements under the current model um, later in this presentation. Third, there are a number of changes to the benchmarking methodology, but we wanted to specifically highlight the changes to the risk score growth cap which were done to further mitigate potential inappropriate risk score gains. And finally, um, again, this is not an extensive list of the additional monitoring and compliance elements, but the ones we wanted to go through here were that um, under the ACO REACH model, there's additional monitoring and compliance efforts and analytics that will first assess annually whether beneficiaries are being shifted into or out of Medicare Advantage, they will be examining ACO's risk score growth to identify inappropriate coding practices. There will be an increased use of data analytics to monitor use of services over time and compared to, reference to a reference population to assess changes in beneficiaries' access to care, including stinting on care. And finally, audit annually reach ACO contracts with providers to learn more about their downstream arrangements and identify any concerns. So again, this is just a summary. I encourage folks to um, follow this link to check out the whole chart. And as a reminder, the ACO REACH model is beginning January 1st of 2023. So with that, I will hand it back to Marissa. Thank you, Julia, for that uh, great overview. We wanted to make sure people understood that we are, though the model was, the new uh, model was only announced less than a month ago, uh, we did review Clover's budget uh, with this in mind, given that it is um, March of this performance year. Um, they're already operating under an agreement um, and the model will be changing. So uh, um, budget ACO budget review is done annually uh, for ACOs in Vermont with uh, we're just gearing up to produce guidance or develop guidance for 2023. Um, and so we will be looking at the Medicare only guidance, uh, you know, looking ahead to, to the new model that they'll be operating under. All right, so Clover Health Partners budget was submitted uh, December 31st of 2021. I'm gonna go through the elements now of the, the budget submission. 
uh, and that is where you'll see our, our recommendations emerge. So I'll, I'll start quick with a uh, overview of the public comment that we've received to date. We went all the way back for the purpose of this slide uh, to the past public comments regarding the uh, proceedings in June, um, where we accepted public comment on the request from Clover that the board waive the review and approval of Clover Health Partners annual budget. Commenters there uh, generally opposed waiving the budget review. We went through a, a public process uh, and on June 30th, the board uh, voted unanimously, unanimously to deny Clover's waiver request. Uh, so that was sort of the first round of, of comment that we we received in this current review period. Uh, the board opened a public comment period uh, ahead of today's staff analysis. Um, we asked people to comment by the end of day Friday so we could review those prior to this presentation. Um, we've not received any public comment um, as of Friday or today, I, I believe. Uh, we did work with the HCA uh, as required, uh, and we uh, submitted their questions as well as our own uh, to to Clover, so that we, you know, felt like we had a complete review. So we thank the HCA for that collaborative process. Um, and this is a reminder that the public comment period does continue until the board votes. Uh, again, we ask that you submit them uh, ahead of the vote um, to allow us to to review any public comment, um, but the, the public comment period is not closed. So um, there's still opportunity to uh, submit that prior to a vote. So here are the key areas of review. This is just based on the guidance. Uh, these were the six sections of the guidance, basic information, the provider network, the payer program information, um, budget and finances, the care model, and then in, any information to help us uh, understand alignment with Vermont's all-payer model. So just some quick basic information that Clover Health Partners is a direct contracting entity. They have been operating in Vermont since April of 2021 under the DC model participation agreement. All the materials that have been submitted to the board that are available to the public are posted on our website at that link if people have not had a chance to, to review those. Uh, and again, like we said, you had an introduction to Clover uh, last spring. Um, one thing we wanted to, uh, to bring forward from that discussion is that there is the pending and ongoing uh, shareholder litigation uh, this is ongoing Department of Justice and SEC investigations. That was as noted in our staff presentation from June 21. Uh, there are multiple shareholder cases ongoing and appear to be generally related to Clover's compliance with disclosure obligations, according to summaries of the litigation in Clover's annual 10K report filed with the SEC. Additionally, Clover's Medicare Advantage plan is involved in multiple disputes by providers for underpayment um, including a lawsuit filed in New Jersey. There are no updates on the GO, DOJ or SEC investigations. Uh, but one recommendation that we had uh, given, the, you know, our um, review of this information um, is that we recommend that Clover Health provide to the Green Mountain Care Board semi-annual updates on any material pending legal actions taken against the ACO or its affiliates or against any members of the ACO's executive leadership team or board of directors related to their duties and any such actions known to be contemplated by government authorities. So we can be kept apprised of any of updates there. The next section of the review is their provider network. Uh, so this is just the basics. They have two types of providers, participant providers. Those are primary care providers who can align beneficiaries and preferred providers for specialists and ancillary facilities uh, to improve care management, quality, and cost of care. Again, these are familiar terminology with our uh, other Medicare agreements that we review. The provider list uh, it is uh, due to CMS in September for the following year. So this timeline, again, aligns with what we are familiar with. This is Clover's 2022 provider network in Vermont. Uh, it consists of one primary care practice um, in Burlington with a count of 20 providers, and they have preferred provider agreements with uh, five um, uh, skilled nursing facilities uh, in Vermont as well.
around the provider network, uh, we didn't have any staff recommendations for 2022. And, you know, the reason for this is that uh, network development questions are included in the annual budget guidance. So we do ask them um, and we did ask them some additional follow up questions on sort of their plans so that we can understand um, as best as possible how they plan to grow or expand in, in Vermont so we can tailor our review accordingly. Um, they do uh, report their provider contract to both the Green Mountain Care Board and, and CMS. So we have a copy of that for examination. Um, so we didn't feel like we had additional reporting requirements there. And so we felt as though we had the information that we needed for 2022 regarding the provider network. Moving on to the payer program, of course, this is a Medicare only arrangement. So there's just the one program as Russ talked about in the beginning, the parameters are set by the DC participation agreement with CMS. The risk and payment option selections are for the entire DCE. So uh, Clover, who is operating in multiple states, um, with, you know, is making selections based on their, their full business. It's not by specific to uh, state or provider. Attribution is done, is claims-based uh, or by voluntary alignment, of which Clover stated they have both in Vermont. This is a high level overview of how the funds flow through the model. Uh, this diagram is a high level view. Um, and again, these parameters are set in the Medicare participation agreement. So um, I'm not going to speak for, for Medicare um, here, but we wanted to present this so that we have kind of a high level understanding of, of how this works. Um, and it should be uh, fairly familiar. Uh, the key takeaways is this is still a fee-for-service model um, with CMS paying for most care via fee-for-service. So that's the area, uh, that's, sorry, that's the arrow from CMS to the providers. Uh, those are fee-for-service adjudicated claims. Um, Clover is, has opted into the primary care capitation model. Um, so the payments that are passing from CMS through Clover to the providers are for uh, primary care payments. So that's what it means when it says, fee-for-service adjudicated claims excluding primary care. The primary care um, is those payments that are flowing from CMS to Clover to the providers in those arrows uh, in the middle. Uh, there is a quality element through potential shared savings or shared losses uh, in the form of a quality withhold. And providers receive payment for using the Clover Assistant, the point of care tool offering clinical support and other capabilities. So CMS is paying Clover uh, a, a capitated payment, and then Clover is then passing that through to providers. Um, and the, the pass-through allows for Clover to, um, uh, to you know, implement their, um, you know, specific, specific model, which in this case is um, adding the Clover assistant payments, which they feel uh, improves the, the quality and, and the value of the care. Um, the shaded arrows are the potential shared savings and losses. So this is to highlight that um, shared savings uh, are passed from CMS to Clover and they uh, can share those savings with their participant and preferred providers uh, according to their contractual agreements. Uh, Clover does hold all of the risk in this arrangement. So shared losses are paid um, from Clover back to CMS and they are not uh, you know, the providers are not on the hook for any shared losses. The risk model, this is an upside downside model, the direct contracting entity has potential for both shared savings and shared losses. As I mentioned, uh, there are wide risk corridors compared to other ACO arrangements in Vermont. The direct contracting entity bears 100% of the risk uh, at less than 25% of the performance year benchmark. The savings and loss rate decreases at greater than 25%, so there are four risk bands, and the participant preferred providers bear no risk. The DCE collects any shared savings and pays any losses. This shows you the risk quarters and the four risk bands, so the risk quarters are automatically set under the CMS agreement. Uh, Clover has selected the global risk sharing option, which is highlighted below. 
And again, this slide is just to show you the options that Clover has selected under the model. Um, and again, we're showing you these for informational purposes. These are set by the Medicare agreement to give you sort of familiarity with how it works. Um, but the, you know, the board doesn't have authority to uh, adjust any of this. It's, it's all part of the participation agreement. So like the Vermont Medicare ACO model, the total spending is compared to a performance year benchmark of the expected total cost of care, which is adjusted for population risk score among other factors. So in, in the case of, of Clover in Vermont, there's about 1,800 aligned beneficiaries expected in 22. This is a minimal change from 2021. The benchmark is set prospectively. Uh, it covers all Part A and, and B Medicare expenditures. And as Julia mentioned, CMS is continuing to address concerns about increased coding intensity through modifications in the ACO REACH model. There's a pretty complex specification for how the benchmark is set. Uh, we're not giving an exhaustive um, review of that here, again, because we, we don't set the benchmark in this case as we do for the Vermont um, Medicare ACO arrangement. Regarding shared savings and losses, uh, Clover presented or submitted the some results to date uh, on their direct contracting margin. Those, those are all the results that we have at this time. Um, the final settlements for the final financial settlements uh, for both 2021 and 2022 are to be reported in July 23. So they will have preliminary results in July 22. I think the intention is uh, generally to have it approximately seven months after the end of the performance year. However, for 21, it's not going to be finalized until 19 months. And for 22, it will not be finalized until seven months. So both results will be reported in, in 2023. So that brings us to the end of the overview of the payer program arrangement. The recommendations that staff came to in this section is that Clover Health provides to the Green Mountain Care Board its shared savings um, segmented for Vermont. So as we showed you in the beginning, they are required to uh, report their shared savings. Uh, that would be at the entity level. Uh, it looks like they're required to report them by participant and preferred providers. Uh, we would like them to report it for Vermont specifically when those results are available. And again, some key points here that I think we've probably been pretty clear on at this point is that those arrangements are set by Medicare. Um, we do have that agreement, so we can, um, you know, we can examine it. We don't have additional reporting needs there at this time. Um, and then there are new requirements in the ACO REACH model around governance, health equity, and additional monitoring compliance that will come on board in 23. So, uh, there, you know, we had contemplated maybe some additional reporting about some of these areas, but since it looks like they're being addressed in new ways in ACO REACH, um, we will wait for that, you know, for the 23 review to take, to take a look at that. That brings us to the end of the payer program section. Uh, the next couple of slides, I'm going to hand over to Patrick, who took a look at the the financial information. Thank you, Marissa. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> uh, yes, we did review the uh, consolidated statements of Clover Health, Clover Health Investments and subsidiaries. I'll try to refer to them as CHI uh, as I move through some of my comments. Uh, which does include Clover Health Partners, and I'll try to refer to them as CHP. Uh, that's the direct contracting entity that's central to this discussion. Uh, at the consolidated level, it's very difficult to carve out CHP's contributions to the overall uh, financial position and the results uh, that are posted. Um, what I could not find and I was hoping for was a, a schedule <clears throat> of various financial statements that would show uh, the line items down the vertical axes and then uh, the different entities contributions to revenue and consumption of resources or expenses uh, that contribute to the overall consolidated look, but I was not able to find uh, that type of perspective. So um, that made it very difficult to understand um, the financial makeup of the entity that we're dealing with here. 
Uh, what we can see at that consolidated level is that CHI is in a stage of very rapid growth uh, with fiscal year 21 revenues growing roughly 119% over their prior fiscal year, uh, uh, rising to about $1.47 billion. <clears throat> uh, and uh, additionally, uh, that that year over year growth is being driven by uh, direct uh, the direct contracting segment of Clover Health Investments, otherwise known as CHP. Uh, we know from the responses of Clover that CHP is the only direct contracting entity within CHI, uh, which confirms that CHP is largely responsible for a lot of that rapid growth uh, of overall revenues from the consolidated perspective as that business segment came online in 2021. <clears throat> uh, revenues derived from the, uh, the operations of CHP began in the second fiscal quarter, uh, and for this entity that would be April through June. Uh, 2021, and as of year end, accounted for roughly 45% of the total consolidated revenues of CHI for that fiscal year. And that's 45% is based on only three fiscal quarters of activity. Uh, so you can project that forward and you can see that that growth uh, is likely going to uh, be much higher once they put a full year of operating activity under their uh, operating results for 2022. So it's very impactful. Uh, additionally, operating expenses have significantly increased year over year, rising 175% up to $2.1 billion, uh, likely because of activity related to CHP. Specific line items of note, as you can see on your screen, uh, where there were major increases driving that overall growth in expenses was uh, net medical claims incurred up 163% over prior year, salaries and benefits up 266% over prior year, and general administrative expenses up 54%. With all of this activity, the net margin uh, continued to erode, falling from a loss of 137 million in fiscal year 20 down to uh, nearly $588 million in fiscal year 21. Um, <clears throat> as of the conclusion of 21, uh, CHI and subsidiaries had accumulated, uh, has, has an accumulated deficit of about $1.6 billion. Um, however, uh, the balance sheet uh, had a marked turnaround uh, despite these losses. Uh, so it appears that there's been some significant capital infusion activity that has occurred during the course of 2021, which has increased the cash, cash position of uh, CHI significantly uh, and driving those assets up 256% over their prior year. Liabilities had a slight downward shift, about 5%. Uh, and the other marked um, balance sheet activity was that um, the equity position completely turned around uh, and has, has uh, posted a more solvent state at $539 million in the positive uh, from negative $617 million in the year prior to that. So <clears throat> there's a lot of shifting activity there. Uh, this is a company that, uh, from a consolidated level that is growing very quickly. Uh, and there's going to be significant activity, I'm sure, as that direct contracting entity uh, shifts into this new model. <clears throat> And so with all of that said, um, it's very difficult to understand where CHP fits into this overall financial puzzle uh, from the consolidated financial documents um, because of the opaque nature of those uh, consolid from that consolidated approach. Our recommendation is to collect uh, audited financial statements that show in some way the contribution of the direct contracting entity uh, to the greater whole. Uh, as I spoke to earlier. Um, <clears throat> this is our recommendation. As I said, it's very difficult to understand the company that we're dealing with uh, when financial activity is folded into the larger consolidated perspective. And additionally, with this uh, level of growth, uh, the auditor's notes that would accompany the audit may provide us with uh, several insights that could lead to a more thorough understanding of the organization and its resulting financial activity. Uh, so in closing, uh, this is not information I think we need for this review specifically, uh, but if Clover does intend uh, to expand their presence in the state of Vermont, uh, it would be information that we should seek as we move forward. Um, and I will note <clears throat> that on the prior slide in the last 24 hours, uh, uh, with Clover's responses, they have told us, in all fairness to them, that their uh, fiscal year 21 audits have been posted, and those I've reviewed them today. Those do have uh, auditor notes, so that's some new information uh, that we've received in the last 24 hours. Uh, but with that, Marissa, I'll turn it back over to you. 
Thank you, Patrick. I did mean to note earlier uh, that we did receive the response, those responses to questions, um, and we received them uh, yesterday without time to fully incorporate them. So um, thanks for your quick review uh, there, Patrick, on that. And if there are other you know, significant areas from those responses that change any of these recommendations, we would let you know before, uh, before the vote if, there, if there's anything else that we note from those responses. Uh, next is, I'm going to pass it over to uh, Michelle Sawyer, who's going to talk about their, the model of care review. Thank you, Marissa. Um, so as Russ mentioned, uh, the staff determined that there are a number of criteria from the statute um, that should be considered when reviewing Clover Health Partners. Um, the criteria on the slide are the summary of the ones that we feel are most applicable to Clover's model of care and population health program. As a reminder, Clover is present in only one primary care practice in Vermont uh, with less than 2,000 attributed beneficiaries, and so we would not expect um, broad population health initiatives this year uh, in light of the limited size and scope. Next slide, please. So um, when we reviewed uh, Clover's model of care, we determined that these aspects of the model listed here um, supported the corresponding review criteria. Um, these are not siloed criteria. There's um, many examples where an aspect of the model might support more than one of the review criteria, so there is some overlap. So looking at strengthening primary care, um, pro uh, participating providers receive full Medicare fee-for-service rates, um, plus for services, plus um, the additional flat payments for use of Clover Assistant, which is their point of care technology, which will be further discussed on the following slide. Um, there may also be shared savings earned by the provider. Um, within Clover Assistant, there is a point of care quality gap alert um, and feedback on quality measure achievement as well that's accessible to the providers. Clover Assistant also provides evidence-based care recommendations at that point of care. And for supporting appropriate utilization, again, providers have access to that evidence-based care recommendation in Clover Assistant. Um, Clover has a complex care program where there is a focus on care coordination, access to care, and health outcomes for highly complex patients. Um, ADT alerts, um, those are the admission discharge transfer alerts, are built into Clover Assistant, um, which is fed in from the Vermont Health Information Exchange. Care coordination services are available um, from social workers and nurses telephonically. These care managers can make both medical referrals and non-medical referrals um, to services to support housing needs, transportation, financial assistance applications, and more. Um, Clover Assistant has a telehealth module to improve patient access to care, and Clover is participating in Medicare benefit enhancements and engagement incentives, which will be reviewed more in more detail later. Um, the next two criteria, integrations with community providers and the prevention of duplications of services. So Clover um, is working to build a network of preferred providers, which are providers of services such as home health, skilled nursing facilities. Um, Clover Assistant provides the ability to make referrals to those local providers. Um, again, those ADT alerts help providers know when their patients have had a transition of care. Um, care coordination is available. Um, Clover has stated that these services, while they are available um, through them, if they're also available through Blueprint or another initiative that um, those efforts would not be duplicated. Uh, socioeconomic pharmacy and lab data are all, and Medicare claims data are all available in Clover Assistant. Um, after an inpatient stay, providers are pro prompted um, to complete a medication reconciliation. And finally, clinical data sharing capabilities are available within the Clover network through that technology. Um, if data were to be shared with um, other providers outside of the network, um, Clover Assistant allows for the provider to share Medicare claims data with those providers. Next slide, please. 
a little bit more about Clover Assistant. Um, much of the qualities of their care model discussed on the previous slides are built into this technology platform. Um, all network providers are given access to and trained to use this technology, which will either integrate directly into the practices EHR or will function as a web-based application. Um, providers are expected to access Clover Assistant with each patient visit um, and are incentivized to do so by receiving a fixed dollar amount for each time it is accessed. Uh, and Clover makes these payments to providers on a weekly basis. Uh, the Clover Assistant has many capabilities, a few of which are highlighted here. Um, they are connected to our health information exchange, which enables those ADT feeds. Um, this allows for providers to receive alerts when their patients are admitted, discharge transfers from hospitals, nursing homes, uh, home health agencies, and providers have access to three years of Medicare claims data and have access to some uh, lab data overnight. Um, regarding population health efforts, Clover Assistant provides real-time quality of care gap alerts to providers, as well as quality measure feedback. Um, providers also have access to socioeconomic data for their patients, which can allow for better person-centered care and consideration of social determinants of health. Uh, and referrals can be made within Clover Assistant and care coordination is available from those um, care managers as well. Next slide. So the benefit enhancements and beneficiary, beneficiary engagement uh, incentives um, as part of the DC model, CMS allows um, DCEs to choose to um, offer these um, uh, enhancements and incentives. Uh, Clover's decided that they would um, offer all of the options from CMS. They are all listed here. Um, so these are these are the ones that um, all of the uh, attributed beneficiaries through Clover they would have access to these. Next slide. All right, the quality measures. So on a quarterly basis, uh, CMS will provide data um, regarding the DCEs or Clover's performance um, for a prior quarter of the agreement performance period on quality measures um, that are listed here. Um, and the reporting and data sharing overview for the last 12 month period that ends on the last day of the relevant quarter. Um, you can see that the measures, the asterisk measures align with our APM quality measures. Um, and it should be noted that that CAP survey, um, that is paid for by the DCE, not the provider. Um, so the provider does not bear the cost of that survey. Um, it is unknown at this point how any of this will shift with the ACO REACH model. Right, uh, last slide please, Mar uh, Marissa. So finally, um, our recommendation around the care model. So uh, we recommend that Clover Health provides the board its quality reporting um, segmented for Vermont, but with appropriate restrictions to protect patient confidentiality. Thank you, and I'll turn it back to Marissa. Great, thank you, Michelle and everyone. So this brings us to the summary of our recommendations. Uh, and again, the board is not voting today, uh, so we can op open it up for discussion. Um, but our recommendation at this time is to approve the Clover Health Partners FY 2022 budget as submitted subject to the following conditions. Clover Health provides to Green Mountain Care Board its shared savings uh, segmented for Vermont. And I think a, a clarification we might add there uh, from their re public reporting requirements is also segmented by participant and preferred providers. Uh, Clover Health provides to Green Mountain Care Board its quality reporting segmented for Vermont, but with appropriate restrictions to protect patient confidentiality, because we understand there is likely a small numbers or there may be a small numbers problem here um, and it's currently one one practice uh, we to collect the audited financials uh, indicating their balance sheet and statement of operations contributions um, submit a standalone audit for chp if it's available it sounds like we may be able to tweak that a bit based on the information that we recently received um, and then the final one 
where we started was that Clover Health provides to Green Mountain Care Board uh, semi-annual updates on any material pending legal actions taken against the ACL or its affiliates, um, et cetera, and we can set what, what the appropriate schedule would be for that. So um, with that, I will turn it back to you, Mr. Chair, for board questions and discussion, public comment, and um, you know, we can discuss when a you know, potential vote may be appropriate. Thank you. Thank you, Marissa. Um, I'll open it up to board members for any comments or questions. Do any board members have comments or questions? Yeah, I have, I have a few, um, so I'll I'll kick it off. Um, just let me and and I'm going to try to filter these, filter out the ones that were answered by the presentation. Um, I don't have a lot, but I have some. Um, my first one is just kind of stepping back and saying, why are we doing this now when the whole model is going to change um, in just a few months? Why, why go through this process when um, the ACO reach process will begin in in uh, twenty uh, twenty three? I'm just wondering if staff have any insight into what the strategic advantage or what any advantage might uh, accrue to um, Clover Health Partners by starting as a um, um, a direct contracting entity and transitioning to an ACO uh, reach entity um, in 2023. Russ, do you want to take the why question? Um, sure, let me, I'm happy to, to try that. I, the, you know, the, the why question, um, Clover came before the board in June. They asked to waive the, the budget process. The board declined to waive the budget process and um, instructed us to put together some guidance. So we're going through a, a budget process. Um, we didn't know in June that the whole model was going to change. Um, we didn't know that until you know a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so yeah, we. We can we have this annual budget process, and so uh, we've been we've been going through it. Um, in terms of whether there's any benefit to an ACO starting in the direct as a direct contracting entity and then moving, I I don't think that there would be. Uh, and I say that because the the way that as we understand the new CMS model is going to work effective January 1, uh, 2023, they have to be, the ACO has to be fully compliant with the requirements of the ACO reach model. Um, and that's regardless of whether they started as a direct contracting entity or whether they're a new entrant who applied to be, uh, to join the program directly into the ACO reach model. Thank you. Um, my next one is kind of uh, um, aligned with that is um, the ACO reach model is going to change um, the board, uh, the board structure of the of the ACO from 25% um, uh, providers to 75% providers. And you know, that that's a good thing. But I'm just want, wondering if as an, as an ACO, Vermont is such a small piece of the ACO pie, whether it's a direct contracting or an ACO reach. Would we have any expectation to have any people um, on on that board for it? Because it, the board is for the ACO entity as a whole, not just for the Vermont portion of it. So I'm just wondering, you know, what. Yeah, and so there's probably thousands, of hundreds of, of providers that are engaged at the entity level. Um, and my guess is that we we wouldn't have much of a chance to have a meaningful participation at the board level. Um, yeah, I think that's yeah. all. Yeah, sorry, Bruce. I think that's also a question for for Clover. Um, Okay. 
well, board, the boards, you know, you're, you're, you are absolutely correct that Vermont is a small um, percentage of their of the Clover Health ACO's overall um, network. Um, OK, so my next question has um, from the report, I should have written the page down here, but it says Clover Health has historically used telephonic nurse care managers and social workers. And so my question is, are these folks at Evergreen or are they out of uh, uh, some out of state phone bank or where are these people? I'll take that. Um, thanks, Tom. Thanks. Um, that has not been clarified. I am pretty confident in assuming that they are not local Vermont providers, um, that they are contracted through Clover Health Partners more broadly. Thank you. So this this is some data that was from um, Clover Investments um, <clears throat> uh, fourth quarter filing and their 2021 filing. Um, and for the DEC beneficiaries, um, there was a little chart in this article that uh, showed that as of December 30, first 2020, there were zero um, DCE beneficiaries um, in Clover. And at the end of December, December 31st, 2021, there was 61,876. So obviously the, that's a lot of growth, but still 61,876 is still only about half the Medicare population that we have in the state of Vermont. That being aside, there are these preliminary quality reports that are due at C CMS for program year 2021 on July of, of uh, the, the, they're due July 2022. And I'm just wondering, given that the number of uh, DC beneficiaries grew from zero to 61,876 in program year 21, how how was that distributed through the year? Because I would think that would have an effect on quality reporting. If if all of these folks kind of were enrolled at the near the end of the year, that's a very short period of time, as opposed to if most of them were at the beginning of the year. Um, so I'm I'm just so that's just a question I'm raising, you know, ab about the quality reports that um, um, <clears throat> that you know that we might not have any any meaningful quality reports on the DCE folks until 2024. I, I can make a clarification there for you, Tom. And again, I'm not going to speak um, for Clover. We, Clover's represent, representation is here, so they um, you know, can answer questions. But the performance year didn't begin until April of 2021. So there wouldn't be that was the that was the first performance year. So that is when um, you know any aligned beneficiaries um, would have come on on board. Yeah. And, then, yeah, and this is Kevin Murphy. All of those aligned beneficiaries would have been aligned April 1st. So we start with that number and we end with a number similar to that. Um, obviously, we lose people to death and moving out of the service area uh, or moving to MA, but all were originally aligned April 1st. So, uh, so just to be clear, so I'm looking at the number 61,876 at the in December of 31st of 2021, but you're telling me that they were all attributed or aligned in by April 1st. So there's uh, three quarters of a year of um, information there. Correct. All right. Thank you. Um, so um, at some point in time, um, uh, I, I understand kind of the the, the different focus of of the, the Medicare uh, current Medicare program in Vermont and and this uh, proposal before us, but I'm just wondering if the um, uh, if there has been any thought about aligning our all payer model um, to which we haven't executed yet, but everyone is hopeful and crossing their fingers that that will happen soon um, with uh with this with this ACO 
um because it's you know we're, we're a small state the all-payer model is really important as a as kind of a blueprint or a template or a pathway forward and i'm just wondering but so we don't really know much about the clover aco and our all-payer model isn't resolved yet and those seem to be two structural entities that at some point we've, we've got uh to have alignment between the two and i'm just wondering if any thought has been uh given to that at our staff level yeah tom that, that's that's a great question um we've we've given it some thought i'm sure others beside me will have thoughts on it um the two points that i uh, included in the presentation, we, we kind of looked at some basic uh, alignment um, questions. Um, you know, we took a look at, at quality measure alignment um, and we took a look at scale. Now, again, um, it was it was sort of an exercise to, you know, kind of get us started because scale, the scale, um, the scale targets are waived for this year, um, but we wanted to, to, to take a look and see, you know, can this since this model didn't exist um, when that agreement was negotiated, you know, what is it that we might want to understand as we go forward um, if we're going to have different types of ACOs operating in Vermont? Um, so, you know, to start, we we looked at scale and we looked at uh, the quality measures. And I think that this is a, you know, is a conversation that we'll want to keep thinking about as we go into those uh, mm -hmm. negotiations for the purposes of the budget uh, review uh in and approval um we didn't think um you know we didn't have any recommendations on on how it would re be relevant here but it is something that we are to keep an eye on um as as we go into those or continue those negotiations so that we can understand how this type of uh ACO arrangement might fit into our future agreement thank you marissa um so i only have like two or three other quick questions here I noticed uh, it was in table three under quality measures. Um, and then there was this column called direct contracting and uh, there were checkoffs on a lot of these measures. Um, but one that wasn't checked was, it's on page 23, diabetes mellitus. Uh, I don't know if I pronounced that right, but um, uh, that wasn't that was not checked. And in Vermont, um, diabetes is some, pre-diabetes is, uh, uh, and where diabetes is a, a significant force in undermining the health of Vermonters. So I'm wondering how this ACO um, will um, engage with a pre-diabetes, maybe through um, uh, Clover Assistant, I don't know, a pre-diabetes effort and um, obviously trying to avoid a diabetes uh, consequence. So that's a question that was on page 23. You can get back to me later. I just saw that it was not checked and I would think that'd be an, an important uh, uh, um, health risk to be engaged here. Um, let me see. And the the uh, other the only other thing I would echo is uh, what Patrick profiled um, the um, Clover Health Investments fourth quarter in 2021 20, uh, financials came out, um, at least they were on the web on February 23rd. So it's just a, a couple of weeks, a few weeks back. The stock over the past year has dropped from $8.12 a share to $3.09 a share. The net loss for the quarter was $187 million and for the full year, $587.8 million. And um, the growth, um, as was said, um, is is going forward in the comments going forward is really aspirational growth around this um, uh, this ACO effort, and I'm I'm just I'm just wondering if I should be looking at the glass as half full or half empty, um, and because the the finances here are pretty much in the red, um, and but the aspirations are are hopeful and. Uh, I'm just wondering if if uh, um, if there's any insight, additional insight into these financials that uh, can um, you know profile the future for uh, Clover Investments and Clover Partnership. So that those are my areas of concern. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Other Tom. Members
other members of the board with the comments or questions? Good questions. Other members of the board with comments or questions? This is Robin. I don't have um, any questions. I thought it was a very thorough presentation and Tom asked a lot of good questions. So um, I guess all I would say is I am interested in having um, a little more discussion around the quality reporting in terms of the fact that it's just one practice and wanting to make sure we have those beneficiary protections in place. Uh, that doesn't have to be today, but um, just wanted to raise that for others to think about. Kevin, I'll just jump in. Um, I really appreciated the, the thorough presentation on all the work that the team did, teams did in analyzing this. Uh, two kind of just thoughts or questions really. One was the provider network. I noticed there was one, obviously there's one uh, primary care practice. There's four or five SNFs. I can't remember how many, none of them being in Burlington. And so I was wondering, I assume that they're contracting with these uh, skilled nurse, nursing facilities as preferred providers in order to support the primary care practice, but none of them being in Burlington. I'm wondering, are these all Genesis uh, skilled nursing facilities? Are these all, what, what is the common theme here um, around those skilled nursing facilities? And are they close enough to the beneficiaries to be of help? We, and sorry, this is Dave. We're happy to, I don't want to jump in out of turn for if, if you all want to ask all your questions and then have Clover respond, but um, certainly Kevin and I can answer your questions as you have them if you prefer. So whatever you whatever you like. Go ahead, Dave, answer the okay, question. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, Kevin, did you want to talk about uh, the, yeah. the SNFs that we have? Yeah, so I can say, um, I don't know. We do have a contract with Genesis. Um, it's likely that you recognize that. I don't know that those are specifically Genesis facilities, but um, we do have a contract with Genesis. Um, and, I, and I know that we've been working with a number of other facilities. We just haven't um, gotten them to contract yet in Vermont. Okay, thank you. Uh, my second question actually is probably not really for Clover, but it was interesting to me, and I'm just this is more to the team, Wondering if there's, uh, I was intrigued by the ACO REACH program and their new requirements around health equity and health equity benchmarks uh, in particular. And I guess I, you know, was going to say to the team, are there any learnings that we can take from those health equity benchmarks that are coming out of ACO REACH and apply them to our some of our regulatory processes or just be thinking about what are they measuring? How are they measuring it? How should we be learning from that. So just wanted to kind of throw that out there. It was intriguing to me and I'd like to hear more about it at some point. Kind of unrelated to this, but uh, this particular decision, but interesting nonetheless. But thank you very much to everybody and, and thank you to the Clover folks for your answering my question. Thanks, Jess. Are there other comments or questions from the board? Thank you, Chair. This is Tom Walsh, um, Marissa and team. I just want to echo the others who thanked you for all the work. This a rapidly changing um, area, and I appreciate the thoroughness of of the work. Um, really, the four things that have um, that I've tried to keep an eye on um, as we've been uh, thinking about this particular case: um, the transparency with the CHP performance, particularly in Vermont. Um, that the way that Patrick described that, uh, there's, uh, it's not easy to see uh, what would be happening um, in our state. And um, so I think that that's important to keep an eye on. Um, I think it's important to keep an eye on um, the, not just the quality of care that, that Vermonters are receiving, um, but actually their health status and their risk of, um, of greater illness or their risk of admission or, or um, what happens over time uh, with that, if we can keep an eye on it. Um, the out-of-pocket expenses for, for Vermonters. Um, in traditional Medicare, there's uh, patients can go where they want, 
Um, but in our discussion, we talk about preferred provider networks routinely. And so it gives me some pause to, to think about what may happen to the out-of-pocket expenses for Vermonters who seek care outside of the preferred networks. Um, and then the fourth and, and last thing is really that I want to keep an eye on and appreciate the staff's help keeping an eye on uh, is the alignment with our um, all-payer model 2.0. I'm still a little unclear on what happens with, with that. Um, organizations like Clover are growing rapidly. It's new to Vermont, but not new to the nation. Um, and if this happens, if similar growth happens within our state, what does that do um, to the um, the plans we have for the next generation of the all-payer model? So those are my four areas, and I think um, I appreciate the thorough presentation. I think the ACO reach um, changes um, help with some of the some of the areas of concern that I've that I brought up. Um, so I really just want to say thank you to the staff for such a thorough job. Hey, if I could, oh, I just want to address the preferred provider piece. Go ahead, Kevin. Um, so I, I want to be clear that um, preferred provider is the terminology that CMS has used to define this class of provider. Um, it does not prohibit a patient from seeing any provider that they choose. They still have, and there are very specific um, uh, precautions that CMS has put in place. The patient still has the right to choose any approved Medicare provider that they want. Um, and we can, we can contract with a preferred provider, but we can't force a patient to see that preferred provider. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. If I could, sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt you, please. Oh, no, that's my understanding to date. And, and that's just an area of concern that I think we, um, we want to pay attention to. So I, I appreciate that, Kevin. Yeah, and, and I was just going to piggyback that and say, you know, in fact, the preferred pre preferred provider network and that language is it has always been to me un unfortunate, but is not even the sort of it, it's the participant providers that are the main providers and the ones that are actually most important to an ACO or a DCE anyway. And so the whole concept of a preferred provider is um, sort of bizarre anyway, and actually sort of the the thing that distinguishes the preferred providers. Is, is not something related to beneficiaries, but to those providers themselves, because it gives them the opportunity to participate in, in multiple ACOs. So they could, per, you know, they could participate with the Vermont all-payer model, as well as with Clover Health or any other ACO. And so that was what was meant to distinguish them, along with the fact that they're not used for alignment. And, and these may be things you know, and I understand the idea of keeping an eye on it. So, so I'm not trying to, to beat a dead horse here. Um, and, you know, in, in, in one thing I'll say is, you know, it, through ACO reach, through direct contracting, one thing that will always remain the same um, and has never, has always been a non-starter as you know, even back to my CMS days developing the models was the idea that patients are not gonna have additional out of pocket expenses, that they will never be restricted in what providers they can go to. And that is one of the key things that distinguishes um, the ACO models from um, Medicare Advantage is there's no prior authorization, medical necessity, necessity review, and those will never become part of they're not now and will not be become will not become part of the model thank you thank david you. is there other comment or questions from the board before i go to public comment i'll ask the healthcare advocate if they have any questions or comments hi jerry mullen <clears throat> excuse me uh, good afternoon everyone sorry i'm kind of losing my voice um so i'll keep my comments brief um just wanted to thank board staff for the opportunity to collaborate on the questions that were asked and just state that we agree with the recommendations that the board laid out um, for you today. So that's all we have. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. OK, at this point, I'm going to open it up for public comment. Does any member of the public wish to offer comment at this time? And I'll go first to Walter Carpenter. Uh, thanks, Kevin. I have a whole bevy of stuff here, but <clears throat> I'll just confine it to a few things. 
Um, first of all, Tom Walsh stole kind of was thinking along the lines that I'm thinking of about patients. And ironically, a health care system is about patients, and this is about business. And one of the things I want to ask here is what is appropriate utilization as a Medicare recipient or someone who's on Medicare and as a patient? I'm curious about what appropriate utilization is and who determines that. And in a system that is rife with middle people, um, the direct contracting entities are just another middle layer. And the preferred provider network, which Tommy so nicely raised, was on my mind because having had having <clears throat> had to face network issues before, I can see where this is going to be a problem for patients. Plus, <clears throat> the direct contracting entity deciding which patients can go where, what is appropriate care, um, <clears throat> and so on and so on and so on. I mean, the incentive for value-based care is to essentially lower the vet, um, <clears throat> decrease access to care so that you make more money. And DCEs are about privatizing Medicare. So <clears throat> I'm really nervous about this. And the questions brought up about Clover's record with shareholders, their profits and losses are good ones. And I, I back those questions fully. I don't think Clover should even be in Vermont, but that's another story. And I think they should be monitored extremely closely and regulated thoroughly. Thank you, Walter. Um, we appreciate your comments. Next, I'll turn to David Alt. Thank you. I just wanted to also um, you know, say what other, others have said about thank you to the, the board staff for all of their efforts. I know from emails and correspondence and from this presentation, how much time and effort they all put in to understand what Clover is doing and the changing intricacies of, of, of these models. I mean, I sit here with the 175 page RFA for the ACO reach and look at it 20 times a day. And I'm still learning about it as I go through it. So um, really appreciate their efforts. Um, and just wanted to comment sort of generally on a couple of things. I don't want to take too much of the board's time, but I did want to note that, you know, through this process, um, I you know there, there was a comment from, you know, a staff member about perhaps not receiving all of the financials that, that would be um, helpful perhaps in an analysis. But I just want to make sure that, um, you know, we, we, we also make clear that we, we had, it's been a goal of Clover from the beginning of this process to respond you know, fully and completely to any questions that that the board or the board staff has had. And, and, and after submitting, um, you know, our, our reporting requirements, we did receive follow up questions from the healthcare advocate, uh, also the healthcare advocate from the, the board staff and uh, have had calls and, and responses to to address those questions and to provide clarity uh, wherever possible. And so I, I just want to, uh, for those on the call who are not familiar with that to, that process, to, to, to know that that has been going on as well. Um, and also just the ACO reach changes, um, you know, obviously have come about uh, for many reasons. I personally think that the vast majority of them are a reflection of the administration change and we were going to see regardless. Uh, there's also been opposition to direct contracting um, over a number of months. And I think, you know, Senator Warren and Rep Jayapal and others have expressed some of these concerns. Um, and so, you know, so I, I think what's really cool about ACO reach is and, and shouldn't be lost. And this was mentioned is the really like the, the double down recommitment of this ACO model to making sure that it is provider led for the patients with patient input. And it's not a, a minor thing to go from 25% governing body representation by the participant providers um, up to 75% and changing that there have to be it, um, two separate voting members for a uh, consumer advocate and a beneficiary representative on the governing body as well. And so I, I think that's a really positive change. I, I think it's great to see. Um, and, you know, um, I, I just want to, to highlight that piece of it as well. In addition to the other protections that, um, that, that, that the team went through to, to do what everybody wants to do, which is to make sure that the, you know, this risk adjustment model that CMS has been using and continues to use 
which everybody knows is imperfect, um, is, is constrained to the best of its its abilities. Uh, while CMS and others continue to try to come up with a better alternative, which which just hasn't been um, has hasn't been found yet. Um, so I, you know, I, I'll pause there. I know that Kevin is, you know, uh, as the the guru on all of this for Clover, happy to answer, you know, more specific questions if anybody has them as well. Um, you know, but but I would just say uh, my final thought is that, you know, in in in, in hearing the presentation um, and and in thinking about the ACOs and and uh, in particular about Clover's presence in Vermont, you know. Just the idea of of seeing the care that is being provided, and you know, it's it's not just about oh, there's this Clover Assistant tool that they use to to help with the processes. Yes, they do, and that, and it's a great tool, but it's also the you know the ability to the care coordination which is involved, and the ability to have patients not have to be in hospitals for three days that um, would otherwise have to be, and can just go to in home care or sniff care instead. And so, I mean, there there's a lot of of, of positive that comes for Vermonters. Uh, through the ACO models, as you know, with the Vermont model, um, and so you know that's why Clover is excited to be to be in Vermont and, and to keep working with uh, patients and providers. Um, oh, and, and, and in terms of the specific recommendations, uh, I think it's my understanding that the board is not taking a vote today. Um, I'll certainly regroup with Kevin and the Clover team on the recommendations, and obviously we can provide any any feedback through the appropriate channels on those particular recommendations. So I won't comment on them today, but but appreciate um, seeing them and, and hearing the thoughts on them as well. Thank you, David. Appreciate that. Is there other public comment? Is there other public comment? Hearing none, um, we'll finish this portion of the meeting and we're going to transition over a discussion on hospital budget guidance for the coming hospital fiscal year. And um, thank you to everyone for the hard work on the Clover presentation. And at this point, I'm going to turn the meeting over to Patrick Rooney. Patrick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to get my screen set up. Please let me know when you can see it. We can. All right, great. <clears throat> oh, good afternoon, board members, uh, members of the public and other stakeholders. Uh, we're here today to kick off the first of uh, potentially three weeks of discussions around the fiscal year 2023 hospital budget guidance. Um, I'm going to try to navigate using this split screen look uh, last year uh, i did an awful lot of toggling back and forth back and forth which is not the most efficient way to try to run through this and so <clears throat> i'm going to make an effort to keep the uh, presentation up on the left hand side of the screen the entire time and then uh, shift back and forth between the actual guidance document and the supporting appendices as we navigate through the presentation uh, so what you can expect today is a review of the changes that we've made to the budget guidance. Uh, and that uh, is in line with the way we've done things in prior years. We're not gonna go through uh, all 14 pages verbatim. Uh, we'll just focus on highlighting some of the changes that have occurred, uh, but also that we have a more integrated approach this year, bringing folks in from some of the other teams to apply their skill uh, to this process. Uh, to better inform you in your decision making as uh, we head into the actual budget process uh, in the summer and early fall later this year. Uh, so you can expect to hear from those folks on the particular sections that they've contributed to and please direct your uh, questions post presentation uh, to those folks as well. So <clears throat> uh, we're going to get started here. Um, with the presentation, a brief overview of uh, the next couple of weeks. So here we are, uh, week one, March 16th. We're going to do an overview, review the appendices and draft budget for some of those changes. Uh, we will take board member feedback uh, in the interim and go back to work and make any adjustments using that feedback that the board would like us to make, uh, including uh, contributions from the HCA. And I will continue to underline that through this. Uh, history has been that uh, the HCA usually contributes to the process once they've received uh, the initial draft of the guidance and get a full view of, of what's changing in this year. And so we've uh, delivered those documents to the HCA for their contributions, hopefully by next week, uh, in which we will review that 
and any other changes that have occurred in the interim, and we have the ability to uh, potentially get a vote through on guidance next week should the board be satisfied with uh, the changes that are made. If we cannot reach a conclusive uh, decision next week, then that would take us into the meeting on March 30th, in which we would do a final review and get to a vote by the board at that time. And that all leads into uh, the staff delivering to the state's 14 community hospitals uh, a final guidance on March 31st. Uh, and then that will take us, as you can see on the screen to the left here, uh, through the next several months as hospitals begin to prepare and finalize their budgets for submission on the 1st. And then we get into a flurry of activity in late July where we present uh, the initial submissions to the board, giving you a first view of what the system and each individual hospital has proposed. Uh, and then we move into the weeks of hearings on at the beginning of uh, on Monday the 15th and Monday the 22nd. And then we get into our deliberative sessions for two weeks in September, ending with the 15th where board votes <coughs> um, need to be finalized. And after that, the staff will work with uh, our council to draft budget orders and get those to the hospitals by October 1st. So a brief overview of priorities, process, and outcome. Uh, again, very similar to uh, last year, hospital financial health and environmental challenges that are being experienced are a priority for this process. Ongoing regulatory alignment. You heard me talk about the integrated team effort. Uh, Data-driven analysis and decisions. We're beginning to incorporate more of that into the work as well, as you will hear throughout this presentation. And then reasonable schedules and turnaround times, and I will uh, build upon that uh, as we move through this, <clears throat> through the process, it was a collaborative effort across GMCB teams. Uh, and as the board chair mentioned, uh, we'll be opening public comments until Monday the 21st for this initial stage of uh, the budget guidance discussion. And the outcome here is to uh, prepare a final draft of the budget guidance with continued alignment of narrative and presentation and updated appendices uh, to support that narrative and presentation as well. So this year, <clears throat> uh, to, to really level set and really tie uh, some of the challenges that exist in our space, our shared space uh, with the hospitals, uh, is, is a review of some of the items from last week for the system. Um, as you heard me mention last week, if you were on our presentation, this is a very difficult time for hospitals to budget, for hospitals to operate, and for board members to uh, regulate, uh, given the fluctuations and volatility that currently exist. Um, <clears throat> with the ebbs and flows of the public health crisis. And so providing kind of a level set and recapture of where things have been. We know the system had a significant downturn in 2020 uh, with a rebound in 2021, but it didn't quite reach its budgeted expectations on the whole. Uh, and then we have approved budgets for 2022 uh, that are heading towards, uh, you know, the $3 billion net patient revenue uh, mark. Um, it is yet to be seen early, as early on as we are here, not even six months into their fiscal year, if that is something that is going to be uh, achievable this year. As we know, it's been a very long uh, few months to start off their fiscal year. Uh, and of course, those decisions that were finalized last year do exceed that 3.5% trend rate for the system that we set coming off of 2019. And to continue in that space, <clears throat> especially as we get into an NPR recommendation by staff, uh, in discussion by the board, uh, you can see here the history going back over the last five years that the board has set uh, a budget growth ceiling. Uh, although the system wasn't meeting that from 17 to 18, it was relatively consistent in its system-wide performance. And then, of course, we have the twin pandemic years here with results being extremely mixed uh, based on the circumstances that have occurred in each one of those fiscal year cycles. And finally, a little more granularity on the net patient revenue piece. We can see here that the results on a hospital by hospital basis has been extremely different, um, but overall pretty much reflect for the most part uh, each one of those years and the differences that exist uh, within. <clears throat> and so that leaves us in a space where uh, 2022 is still uncertain uh, and there's going to be ripple effects, no doubt, that take us into the 2023 uh, fiscal year that we're discussing uh, here today. 
And to highlight it and capture everything is that although we have that fluctuation in net patient revenues that ebbs and flows with the pandemic and the circumstances therein, the one thing that has not uh, fluctuated that much is operating expenses. They remain consistently on the rise. And as you heard us discuss last week <clears throat> and board members discussed as well, uh, there are certainly going to be further challenges in that space uh, throughout this current fiscal year and looking into 2023. So we wanted to provide some look back context there uh, just to underline that and really level set uh, for the discussion that we're going to have over the next couple of weeks. So now I'm going to move into the guidance document on the right hand side of the screen. I'm going to touch on some uh, some minor issues before we start getting into some of the uh, changes and additions that we've made. And I'll start with the timeline here. Um, to help with some flexibility, a minor uh, narrative change here around the August 1st capital expenditure sheets and adaptive. We just added not later than. Um, that way hospitals can feel comfortable that if they want to submit it all on July 1st, they may. Uh, we initially pushed that back a month to allow them to focus on the operational components of their budget and getting that in so that we can uh, get that piece moving. Uh, and so we know that some hospitals enjoy putting everything in on July 1st. Some prefer a couple of weeks of flexibility. Some take the full month. That's entirely fine. Uh, but setting that expectation that August 1st is the date because we need to begin to prepare materials for um, <clears throat> our board members. Moving down to the deliberations period, September 1st to the 15th, uh, we do have a note here that the board will deliberate in order of budget hearings. This is from some feedback that received from hospitals last year that they weren't sure when the board was going to deliberate on their specific hospital. That was great feedback. And so uh, last week, uh, Cara Kreiss, our administrative assistant, sent out the hospital uh, budget hearing schedule. And so hospitals can expect boards to deliberate in the order in which you present. Uh, the only caveat to that is if there is outstanding material items that the board has requested and need to make a decision on, uh, we will bump you from that space in deliberations uh, as we await that fo those follow up items. Um, also, it does not guarantee the board will make a decision during that deliberation. Uh, however, it's been my experience that the vast majority of the time as the board deliberates, they ultimately arrive at a decision in the same day. So a small change. Uh, hopefully that helps our hospitals plan uh, as we look several months out around vacations, <clears throat> time off, and also preparation for those budget hearings. Moving down onto <clears throat> uh, page five here. This is a space in the net patient revenue uh, part of the guidance that will remain blank until the board uh, reaches their final decision, uh, and then we will populate the date and the percentage growth should the board choose to make a decision in that space. Uh, but that is something that we'll see week over week as we begin to migrate our way towards uh, a decision on uh, overall budget guidance and potentially net patient revenue fixed pay perspective payment growth. Moving down into the uh, factors considered during review, our legal team has put forth a few other uh, criteria factors that the board may use, and you're going to get a clear understanding of why these exist uh, as members of our team begin to discuss some of the additions later on. Uh, but the majority of these uh, exist around some of the uh, data monitoring component that we've built in this year. This is something we discussed in our Jan January 26th uh, preview for the board. Uh, so this is giving you the capacity to uh, consider some of those factors in the decisions that you will make later on this year. And in addition to that, <clears throat> uh, uh, underlining some of the uh, volatility in the uh, healthcare finance space and healthcare operational space uh, is the hospital's extraordinary labor costs and investments in labor, as well as impact of those costs and investments on the affordability of healthcare. And that is tied back to House Bill 654, which has made its way through the legislature, allowing the board uh, to consider those extraordinary factors in their review of hospital budgets for fiscal year 2023. <clears throat> Moving down into the narrative section, uh, you'll note that as we get into this section, 
that the presentation on the left uh, identifies each section in which there will be highlights and there have been and therefore have been changes. So here we are in narrative section A executive summary. You can see on the left hand side that we are tying it to that. So one of the requests from the board was that we add uh, some narrative here to uh, capture sustainability planning at the hospital. We've left it fairly broad in this executive summary space for a few reasons. One, uh, funding for sustainability planning is actively uh, moving through the legislature as we speak. So there is still uh, a level of uncertainty there in that space. However, uh, as the strategic leadership of these hospitals will be effectively signing off on these budgets and uh, presenting these budgets, uh, we felt it was important that we bring this uh, in as part of the executive summary because certainly this pandemic uh, is continuing to uh, to teach some lessons about uh, sustainability of the healthcare environment and we look forward to hearing from hospital leadership on what some of those lessons are and potentially what some of the strategic uh, vision is in helping bring about a more sustainable healthcare space for their institution so we've left that relatively high level of course, uh, these are the changes that the staff has put in here. And once we get to recommendations, we'll talk about uh, the board's ability to accept, reject, or alter those uh, as they see fit. Uh, so we'll continue to <clears throat> move through the presentation here. Our next stop is going to be narrative section B, subsection three, which is charge request. And <clears throat> you can see here in uh, the subsection, subsection D, uh, that we're looking to follow up on results of the hospital's approved change in charge for fiscal year 22. This has been in discussion for a couple of years now with uh, some board members, and so we thought we would propose this as part of an addition here. So this section will capture what the hospital is asking for in subsections A, B, and C, and some of the detail that comes along with that, but also uh, allowing us to understand some of the results of the approved change in charge for fiscal year 22. We read in at least one of the narratives from 21 that a hospital has effectively reduced its cost on certain services and therefore has been able to reduce its charges. And that would be good information for uh, the board to have as it relates to what was approved last year. Uh, we've had another hospital at the outset of the year who said we've had certain uh, volume uh, conditions that have changed. These assumptions were very, very different for our budget, therefore, we reserve the right to go the full amount, but we're not going to right now. Uh, and also the results of some of the negotiations with commercial payers are important too to understand. Yes, we may have approved you for a hypothetical 4%. Did you actually get approved for that? So the hospitals can, or for the, so that the board can get a better idea of uh, the request this year and what they, the hospital received and employed in their finances for the year prior to that. <clears throat> The next stop, uh, we are going to section C. Uh, this is another piece that we proposed in our January 6th presentation as uh, the pandemic has opened a lot of fissures around uh, access to care and equity and equitable access to care. Uh, so we wanted to pose a question to the hospitals about what their hospital is doing to recognize and correct inequities in their community and prepare for the development of health, health equity measures. Uh, we know that CMS is moving in this space. We just heard uh, that health equity <clears throat> is going to be a part of this new uh, model, this REACH model uh, in our prior discussion here with Clover. And so health equity is really taking, uh, is really being spearheaded by several components of our healthcare system. And we want to start to understand what our hospitals are doing in that space by calling that out directly as part of this budget process. <clears throat> Moving on, we're going to come into the value-based care participation space and some reimagining of uh, the questions and approach uh, around this particular space and its contribution to this process. And this is where we begin to uh, integrate our team members from other components of the Green Mountain Care Board's reg regulatory process and having them apply their knowledge base to uh, the hospital budget process in general. And our point person there has been Michelle Sawyer, who's been working in this space back and forth with her team and our team in crafting some of these questions. So I'm going to turn it over to Michelle to walk you through these items and some of the logic that she's using to arrive here. So Michelle, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Patrick. 
Um, so most hospitals in Vermont are participating in value based care arrangements. Um, and these questions serve the purpose of hearing about that experience from the hospital's perspective um, and how it's impacting their operations, priorities and delivery of care. Um, it's also an ongoing effort of the board to align regulatory processes whenever possible. Um, the board's been given the authority um, of ACO oversight, and these questions serve to better integrate that authority with that of um, the hospital budget process. So the first question, um, referencing the data submitted in Appendix 5, if there are any value-based care programs that the hospital is not participating in for calendar year 2023, please explain why and describe any barriers exist that exist. Um, if changes, uh, what changes, if any, to these programs would need to be made in order to facilitate your participations? Um, so Appendix 5 just refers to a very simple table um, as part of the workbook in which the um, hospitals list out the um, the arrangements that they have with one care by payer. So the following questions assume that the hospital answering them is participating in at least one of these payer programs. The second question, understanding that the pandemic has just started to recede, what changes in each of the hospital's cost centers that relate to value-based care initiatives, such as population health management, care coordination, chronic condition management, et cetera, um, what changes to those cost centers have been made as a result of participating in the ACO? Be specific in describing each cost center and how it has changed since joining the ACO. Additionally, speak to how the fixed payments or other ACO payments from One Care Vermont are or are not advancing value-based care at your hospital. The third question has three parts. Uh, A, as the pandemic recedes, what po specific population health priorities are emerging for the hospital? Um, obviously, we know where um, all nearly all of efforts have been focused, but we're hoping that as um, things are starting to shift, that that maybe some energy can be put towards uh, other priorities. Uh, B, how will each of these priorities be conveyed to providers in order to impact care delivery? And C, how will success be measured for each of these initiatives? The fourth question, uh, as of calendar year 2022, One Care Vermont is providing each hos uh, hospital's um, HSA with quarterly quality reports. How are the results of these reports being communicated to providers in a way that will impact care delivery and quality outcomes? And the final question is two parts. Uh, regarding the calendar year 2020 settlement information from the hospital, which will be provided uh, in some tables, um, what are the planned investments of those dollars in furthering the hospital's health care reform goals? And if no investments in health care reform were made with these dollars, how are they invested? And then the second part of this question takes into consideration the fact that while all of the hospitals did receive um, a settlement for calendar year 2020, um, not all of the hospitals experienced um, a net shared savings. So some experienced a shared loss during this time period. So the, that second question asks, um, you know, if they experienced a net shared loss, how is the hospital using that information to inform uh, change to their delivery system? And that is uh, that is the value-based care participation questions. Thank you, Patrick. I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Michelle. Very thorough. Um, so the next stop here on the guidance document and some of the changes is around supplemental data monitoring, uh, which is a direct connection to some of the work that has been done in the sustainability space. And to speak about this, I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff Batista from our analytics team. Jeff, the floor is yours. Thanks, Patrick. Um, so jumping right in, section G, we'll uh, delve into the relationship between a hospital's budget and some of those things under the hood. For example, um, the characteristics of their communities, especially how they've evolved over the past uh, decade or so, as well as the choices and characteristics of their uh, peer hospitals throughout the state of Vermont. It's broken into three sections. Um, so if you go to section one there, the market share report, um, we're going to take key service lines 
and look at uh, the changes in charge and um, discharge migration uh, over time to see uh, which hospitals have been growing, which uh, service lines which have shrunk, and uh, where patients might be migrating over time. It's very similar to the patient migration and patient origin dashboard. It's currently published on the website. Uh, for section two, uh, summarizing that, it's going to be very similar to the Burns HMA work, uh, looking at how reimbursement and costs vary across the, um, the hospitals and service lines. Um, hospitals will be asked to explain the, uh, the outliers and their performance compared to other hospitals. Um, the question's still being uh, ironed out here. And um, section three will be the demographic report, just a quick and easy um, tables and visuals of uh, how certain populations have changed in each health service area over time and how that might affect the bottom line of hospitals moving forward. Um, the hospitals will receive uniform data sheets in June. Uh, we'll be generating much of this data ourselves and they'll only be asked to respond to a certain list of questions, the examples being right here. Um, ease and efficiency are at the top of our minds and uh, we hope to uh, hone this particular part of the budget guidance to serve that. So I will pass it back to Patrick. Thank you, Jeff. And Jeff highlighted some very important points there is that this is uh, data that's being generated by the staff. Uh, all we are asking is that hospitals uh, help us understand the results of this uh, as it relates to their specific organization uh, and build that out in their narrative. Uh, and as Jeff noted, very important, we'll provide these reports uh, by June of 2022 so that can be incorporated into the narrative. <clears throat> Moving ahead here, um, one last item on the, the actual guidance document is that we have removed the hospital budget hearing exemption criteria. Uh, that is the result of discussions that we've had with board members over the last week. Uh, and I think the information we presented last week and some of the volatility that continues to exist in the space uh, has, the, has the board wanting to hear from each individual hospital. Uh, especially as things continue to evolve over the next few months as they have over the last few months. Uh, so we have removed that. That will be part of our uh, recommendation here. Um, and to just fill out the uh, guidance here, we have built out in the presentation as we seek to keep the narrative and the presentation flowing together. Uh, we've just built in the equity and supplemental data monitoring pieces as those are two entirely new uh, components to this. So <clears throat> that rounds out the actual uh, budget guidance document. I'm going to next move uh, to the appendices. Um, changes here are relatively limited, and we heard Michelle talk about some of that. Uh, one of them is the inflation table. Uh, we have added an example down here uh, from a hospital that populated it last year. However, as we get into the board discussion, uh, board member Holmes pointed out to me that this was not uh, uh, properly filled out. And so I think that leads us to uh, needing a little bit more explicit instruction to make sure that we have a consistent uh, population of this data here and that it's done correctly by hospitals. So our intent here is to provide an example. This will change. Uh, based on some of the discussion that we have uh, once the board members are sharing their comments. Um, next up is Appendix 5. This is what Michelle spoke about. We've broken out here by payer if the hospital can provide that information for Blue Cross and MVP. We did leave the commercial space open uh, if this is not possible or if there are potentially other commercial payers that exist outside of the MVP and Blue Cross space. Um, <clears throat> The, excuse me, the COVID-19 advances and relief funding, we've removed some of the past uh, descriptions, so please add the source. They have, of course, changed over time. We've had ARPA, we have uh, uh, some of the more recent uh, funding sources that have come through. We've eliminated fiscal year 20. That's kind of old news now. And so we've built in uh, a similar three-year look to the past where um, please provide us updated September 30th, 2021 figures now that your year is final. Activity in 2022, and you'll notice that just as we did last year, we removed amounts received. We don't want to pretend like more money is on the way if it's not. However, recognizing in revenues or recorded as liability is money that was received in 22 and perhaps has not yet been uh, pushed through the income statement 
for fiscal year 22 as of when the budgets are received. So we just uh, reconfigured this uh, to update it for 2023 as we continue to look forward in that direction. Uh, and finally, we removed the COVID, COVID vaccine tab. Uh, last year, we allowed for uh, <clears throat> adjustments to net patient revenues and, and uh, operating expenses that had to do with the mass vaccination effort that the hospitals were undertaking about a year ago. We understood at that time that would most likely be a one-time effort, and, and then after that, things would move into the direction that they have where um, we simply go and receive any booster shots that we may need a as they come up. So uh, that mass vaccination effort is, is no longer uh, in play, so we've removed that tab from uh, the appendices. So <clears throat> as we continue to migrate through uh, the discussion here, I will put the uh, guidance document back up here. Um, as we continue to migrate through the discussion, uh, we do need to discuss uh, NPR for 2023. Uh, also, uh, a point for discussion that we'd like to hear from the board is how would the Green Mountain Care Board like to continue access to care and wait times monitoring? in the 2023 process. Uh, primarily the results coming from the wait times task force was that monitoring should continue, but also we know from that effort that uh, the, the measurement we've been using, third next available appointment, is not a great uh, uh, measurement by which to monitor. And so we're hoping we can receive some guidance in that space to include in this year's budget guidance so that we can continue to do our diligence in that space. Uh, and then highlighting, and I'll continue to do this, that uh, uh, the HCA has yet to contribute to the guidance, and I want to make sure we carve out a space uh, for them in the coming week uh, to uh, offer up their, <clears throat> their contributions to the fiscal year 2023 guidance. So uh, with that, uh, we have uh, a little bit of work here to do with hospital budget policies, including uh, some potential changes to the budget amendments and adjustments policy. And I'm going to turn it over to our staff attorney, Russ McCracken, to walk the board through that. Russ. Uh, great. Thanks, Patrick. I will. Um, I think I can just speak to this. It, it's fairly straightforward. Um, I'm going to start with the policy on hospital budget enforcement. Um, last year, as you probably remember, the board adopted a standing policy. Uh, so it would be effective from March 31st, 2021 forward. Um, we're not recommending any changes to that at this time, uh, so we're not recommending any board action. Um, it would simply be the same enforcement policy that was put in place last year, uh, carrying forward through this year. Uh, secondly, accompanying the, the guidance every year is a policy on budget amendments and adjustments. Uh, this covers um, mid-year adjustments uh, that might be made for accounting purposes, um, provider transfers, uh, other unexpected changes in the hospital's budget, and it includes um, requested mid-year amendments. And for any uh, requested mid-year amendment, the um, policy has a uh, list of steps that the hospital would follow, sending a note to, sending a formal uh, letter of request to the board requesting the change, um, some information that that letter has to include. And our recommendation is to add to that policy that if a hospital is requesting a rate increase, it must notify the applicable commercial insurers of the requested rate increase uh, prior to the board taking action on the, on the requested increase. Um, that is a, a suggestion that uh, we recommend adding to the, the steps. Um, for hospitals requesting mid-year uh, budget amendments. And uh, I'll make sure that both of these policies are included with the um, primary hospital uh, guidance document here on the, on the website and circulated to the board. Uh, and uh, that was all I had, so back to you, Patrick. Thank you, Russ. <clears throat> So as I alluded to, uh, we do want to discuss uh, the recommended uh, fiscal year 23 NPR FPP growth ceiling. Uh, and doing so, uh, we're attempting to capture some of the fluctuating activity that has occurred in the healthcare finance space. And so to talk through the next couple of slides, I'm going to turn it over to 
uh, one of the newer members of our finance team, Matt Sutter, to walk us through uh, some of the information we have up on the screen. Matt. Everyone, thank you. Um, so as, as Patrick said, you know, given the uncertainties surrounding the pandemic and kind of general economic conditions, we wanted to look at um, recent inflationary trends as kind of a guide for recommending a, a reasonable growth target. Um, so we looked at a couple of different indices. We looked at um, producer price index for medical care services, which is reflected in the green, and then consumer price index for healthcare services in the blue. And so each of those bars on the graph represents a six month um, six month period. And, and the reason we looked at that is because it, the way it's presented, we get uh, monthly inflationary data. And if you just graphed it out, it looks wild, right? So we're trying to smooth out some of the um, variances you see month to month and get a um, probably a better grasp, at least for our purposes of understanding um, sort of broader trends. Um, as you, Without going into discussing each number, as you can see, um, the red line here represents um, the start of COVID. And you can see um, with green, especially the producer price index, that increasing um, significantly relevant to relative to uh, prior year periods before COVID. Um, interestingly, um, COVID kind of resulted, it looks like a little bit of a drop in consumer price index, um, at least at the outset, and especially um, in some of those periods, like for example, last summer, um, I guess I'm, I, the num numbers are kind of small, but I, I think it's through March through last uh, August, you're seeing kind of a drop um, lower than average um, inflation only to spike again. And so I don't, I, I can't describe, um, I can guess at why that is, but uh, my hunch is it has something to do with um, vaccinations around that period and um, the economy kind of starting to look like it was rebounding and things getting back to normal. Um, but as you can see, a 2% spike in both CPI and PPI um, over the last six months is, is concerning. Um, but I think you can go to the next one if I'll set there. So on this one, the table on the left is basically just showing in a table format the same data from the chart on the previous slide um, to kind of develop some kind of um, projection. We just took looking at the last six months and kind of knowing the environment the world's in right now, um, fuel prices, et cetera, sticking with that kind of 2% six-month inflation period for our, our the red um, projected periods. Uh, seemed kind of like a, a safe number to go with. And so our methodology here was to look at pre-COVID inflation in those tables on the right, um, pre-COVID inflation averaging at about a percent every six months, uh, jumping to about 1.6% in the periods after COVID started, um, which is reflects about a 61% increase in terms of just inflationary pressures um, above the normal. And the table below is called the projected inflation is just including those red lines. So those um, two six month periods where we're projecting out of uh, two percentage inflation. And if you include that, then we're looking at about a 75 percent increase over where we we typically are um, in terms of uh, producer price index inflation. And so trying to come up with a methodology of or at least offering a recommendation for NPR growth. Um, decided to take you know three three point five percent that we normally have in a in a typical or we've had typically um in a pre-COVID let's say one percent every six month inflationary environment and saying hey if we're inflation's up we're seeing inflationary pressures up 75 percent over the typical let's recommend uh 75 percent above our 3.5 percent which gets us to about 6.1 um and that's that's the methodology there. I can let Patrick fill in um, additional details, but um, I think we'll discuss that on the next slide. Yes, thank you, Matt. So <clears throat> that's our approach to trying to get to a, recomm a recommendation. Uh, we do acknowledge that in this environment, uh, it could probably be just about anything right now. However, we wanted to use some of these uh, indices to help guide our recommendation to some extent. Uh, we understand that looking forward is very, very difficult. We've talked about that ad nauseum, uh, but from what we're seeing here is that the COVID world has seen uh, growth uh, at levels that um, we were not experiencing prior to that. And we factor that in 
uh, and say, well, you know what, as things stand today, if they stand as they are, we can expect those levels moving forward. Uh, but then again, nobody really knows. So um, that's the approach that we took in regard to an MBR figure. So wrapping up here with staff recommendation, uh, we do recommend that the board establish an MPR growth ceiling figure uh, and our recommendation to you to accept, reject, or alter uh, is the 6.1% uh, with the factors that Matt cited on the previous slide, and that is tied to uh, some of the figures that we have, the most recent figures that we have in those consumer and producer price indices data. We don't recommend any guidance on average change in charge for fiscal year 23 due to the unprecedented rapidly changing environmental factors and challenges that our hospitals are experiencing. Uh, we do recommend the elimination of budget hearing exemptions uh, for the reasons discussed. We also recommend the addition of sustainability planning discussion component to narrative section A. And we also recommend the addition of the change in charge results questions uh, that we outlined in narrative section B relating to the hospital's fiscal year 2022 Green Mountain Care Board approved rates. Uh, and also we recommend the addition of health equity question in section C of the narrative. Uh, migrating down the list here, um, we also recommend the addition of the reimagined value-based care participation questions in section E of the narrative and the addition of the supplemental data monitoring pilot uh, reports in section F. Again, those reports are due to the hospitals in June of 2022. Uh, we also recommend continued deferment of the quality budgetary component until the collaboration with VPQHC quality task force results become available. Uh, last I was aware, those were due uh, sometime in August of 2022. Uh, however, <clears throat> the reason we're recommending this is that um, this is tied directly to sustainability. Uh, I've taken part in a couple of those meetings uh, in an ob observance uh, capacity with uh, Michelle Degree and board member Walsh. Uh, and there's a, a solid group of folks uh, and stakeholders involved in that. And the hope is that that work will produce some meaningful uh, quality insights that we can use in our processes moving forward. So we feel that that's the best space for uh, that work to occur, uh, which is out, of course, outside of this process here. Um, we also recommend the updates to the budget amendment adjustment policy that Russ walked us through. Uh, and finally, here at the end, uh, continue discussion on the approach for monitoring of wait times and what the board would like to see in that space and how we can go about that. Uh, and also, again, highlighting and underlining uh, that the HCA contribution is not yet part of this discussion and we would need that uh, prior to a vote. So that brings us to the end of the staff presentation here. And of course, uh, wrapping back to the beginning of the discussion, uh, after this meeting today, we would move towards uh, the March 23rd meeting, make adjustments to the guidance here <clears throat> and have the opportunity potentially to have a final vote. Uh, and if that does not occur, then further adjustments moving after that meeting, moving toward the 30th uh, and getting to that final vote space. So with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I will turn it back to you for board comment and feedback. Thank you very much, Patrick. I'll open it up now for board comment or feedback. Who would like to start? I can start. Um, Thank you to Patrick and the team um, for your presentation and walking us through proposed changes. I did have a couple of questions and comments on the guidance document itself. Um, the first is in section one, which is on the bottom of page four of the guidance. Um, so which indicates that we will review and evaluate the submission in the context of the actual 21 and projected 22 and challenges presented by COVID. One of the things that I thought was super helpful last year, given that we know 2020 was low and 2021 was had its own challenges and now 2022 is having yet more challenges. Uh, it was helpful to me to go back to 2019 so that we can kind of get a sense of um, kind of where we were. So I'm 
and this maybe is more of a question for legal to ponder, but I wonder if we need to be more explicit that we actually may want to go back further than 2021 when evaluating the budget submission. So that nobody needs to respond to that now. I just wanted to throw that out there because uh, I think because of the COVID challenges, it is tough uh, to not take an even broader sort of historical view. Um, I also had a comment on the hospital sustainability planning. Um, I would like to see more uh, specific language there. You know, we've been working on sustainability planning for quite a long time now with, of course, a pause uh, due to COVID and some change in uh, approach because we wanted to take some burden off of the hospitals. Um, but I, I do, I would be very interested in understanding from each hospital uh, how they're looking forward to potentially engaging in the sustainability planning as we move forward. So if um, the resources in the budget and S-285 are passed, you know, I do think we've committed, should we get those funds to a, a significant process and uh, there was a discussion about providing opportunities at all stages of process for meaningful participation. And I think, you know, given that um, hospitals will be submitting their budget not too long after the, the session, that hospitals need to be thinking about how they would be able to meaningful part meaningfully participate. Do they have resources set aside? How are they thinking about that on their end? So um, I think you know, obviously we're not going to know by the end of the month what's happening with the money, but uh, given that sustainability started as long ago as 2019 and way back when we were doing the Rural Health Services Task Force, uh, you know, I don't think even if we don't get the money that we can stop looking at those issues, that we just wouldn't have the resources to do uh, as uh, thorough a process. Um, so maybe that's something the team can put their heads together on in the guidance. Um, and then I think I had one other. So, and I had one other question, which is maybe a question for uh, Vaz or some of the stakeholders to think about and provide public comment on in the healthcare reform, value-based care participation, excuse me, and E, which is on page 10. Um, I'm wondering if the term cost center has a meaning and is the right terminology um, in the question E little little I to double I, um, you know, because certainly the blueprint brings certain resources to communities and the hospitals work collaboratively with the blueprint community health teams. They often host in most of the counties, they host those teams. Um, so. I want, I want to make sure they're thinking about this question broadly um, and not just in a financial way. So I don't know if it's operations or some other term, um, but I'd love to hear some feedback on how people interpret that and whether we have that question worded in a way that makes sense to the people answering it. Um, in terms of the NPR FPP recommendation, I think it's useful to look at the inflationary measures that are specific to healthcare, but I also think it's useful to look at inflationary measures that are applicable to consumers and Vermonters who then have to pay uh, the bill. Um, so I'm wondering if we could also take a look from that perspective and then my other question related to that is uh, NPR is, of course, price and utilization. Um, so how do we think about that when we're looking at the various economic measures? And then lastly, um, this is a significant departure from the total cost of care trends that we've committed to in the all-payer model agreement between 3.5 and 4.3 percent. So I'm this may not be possible, but I'm wondering if you could reach out to Sarah Lindbergh and see if we can get a sense of how this would impact our performance under the agreement um, 
in the future as a point of reference. Now, obviously, that's we we're in extraordinary circumstances. There's you know the cost. We certainly have heard a lot about cost of travelers and workforce pressures, and those absolutely need to be taken into consideration. But I think for me, I need to see the whole picture to understand uh, how the decision um, will impact uh, all different parts of the system. And that's, those are my comments and thoughts. Thank you, Robin. Are there other comments or questions from board members? Sure, I'm happy to go. Go ahead, um, Thank you. So I guess I'll, I'll I'll go actually in order of my notes, which may or may not be helpful <laughs> to everybody else's order. But um, one was I started with one of your last questions, which was around wait times. And um, so I think it's really important to burn on build on the learnings from the wait times investigation. I think understanding wait times is going to be critical. Uh, I know there was a recommendation for the Department of Financial Regulation to be monitoring wait times going forward, and they are seeking statutory authority to do that, but that will take time um, and may not even happen in this legislative session. So I, I think that it's, you know, the onus is on us to at least understand what's happening in wait times in our hospitals that we regulate. Uh, as you said, Patrick, the third next available appointment is not, we've learned through that process that it's not a great measure of the patient's actual experience in trying to access care. There's, there's two components to wait times. One, I'm going to call the referral lag. The referral lag is the time between uh, when, a, for example, a primary care provider, this is in specialty care, a primary care provider makes a referral and when that appointment is scheduled. Uh, and, and in some instances, that can take weeks, unfortunately. Uh, and then there's the visit lag, which is the time between when an appointment is scheduled and the actual visit date, and that can take months. And, and so the, one of the recommendations that I'll throw out there uh, for a way for us to me better measure wait times and, and those two components, the referral lag and the visit lag, would be for asking hospitals for all of their practices primary care and their specialty care practices. And I wouldn't define what those specialty care practices are. I would just say for all of your primary care practices and specialty practices, because I think last year we missed some of the specialties that some hospitals had in the form that we put out there. Uh, but I would also add imaging in there, because I think that's an area where we saw that there was significant wait times um, in some areas of the state. So I think for all practices, primary care, specialty care and imaging, a way to uh, get at referral lag would be the percentage of appointments that are scheduled within two days. And again, that's when a referral was submitted to when the appointment is scheduled. And then for the visit lag, I would suggest a percentage of new patients seen within two weeks, one month, three months, and six months. And uh, the reason to focus on new patients, I think, is because I think uh, re repeat patients or current patients may have different lags, different experiences gaining appointments. I think it's probably onerous to ask hospitals to give us new and existing patient information for all of those. I think new patient appointments will be a good proxy for what the wait time experience is. Uh, just using percentage of patients within two weeks doesn't really get us the tail. How many patients are waiting a really long time? So by getting two weeks, one month, three months, and six months, you start to get an understanding of the distribution of wait times across uh, patients. So that's what I'll throw out there as a possibility um, for really getting a better sense of wait times. Um, just in my notes here, I, I, workforce is such a significant issue. We've been hearing about it from, from hospitals, from other, you know, uh, providers outside of the hospital systems. We know that there's a significant shortage in, in, in issues. We know the expense of travelers. So I think it would be helpful to have just a couple of questions around workforce that are specific to workforce. One would be I'd really like to understand the percentage of their nursing staff that are that are travelers and what they're projecting as travelers. We often get that information from them, I think, but having it uh, be a specific 
aspect of this question. I think also recruitment and retention we know is a really costly to an organization. So I think it will be helpful to understand turnover rates, turnover rates for MDs and turnover rates for the nursing staff um, to better understand what is happening um, with, with that. And that will be a good indicator of the recruitment and retention efforts that have to be done. And then just an effort, you know, understanding the efforts to try and reduce shortages or reduce the workforce pressures, I think would be helpful to understand. I think there's some hospitals that are doing some really innovative things to try and increase the pipeline. And I think it would be helpful for us to learn what those innovative things are and to the degree that some of those um, opportunities could be, you know, shared across other hospitals, that would be useful to know. So that would, those are kind of two of the areas that I know that wasn't in the guidance already, but might be added. Um, I think, all right, well, let me just start with, uh, as I'm going through the document, net patient revenue is one of the first features of, you know, with the double X's that we have here to fill that in. So I'm just going to share what I shared earlier in uh, January. I think that setting NPR growth rates has always been a really blunt instrument, but I think it's blunt, really blunt this year more than ever. We, as you said, you know, we have tremendous uncertainty this year. Budget planning is going to be very challenging. We don't know what inflation is. We don't want, know what utilization is going to be. You know, some hospitals may have built in pent up demand in their budgets for this year, um, in which case, you know, volumes may fall if that pent up de demand was met or populations decline um, in certain areas that may be, you know, we may see a decreases in volumes next year. But we may also see, you know, other hospitals that were more conservative in their estimates of what happened, what was going to happen to utilization this year, maybe seeing a spike. So I just feel like we don't really know, but the hospitals do. The hospitals have a better sense of what that utilization might look like based on what they, you know, put in their budgets this year and what they're seeing in real time. Uh, inflation, you know, I appreciate the effort here to try and um, use some economic data to predict inflation for next year. I think the way this, uh, the approach here in some sense assumes that the change in inflation pre-COVID to post COVID is going to remain the same going out a little bit. You know, I think just during this call, we uh, the Federal Reserve has increased the in, uh, interest rate by 25 basis points for the first time since 2018. And they're projecting numerous more increases in uh, the interest rate, which should have an impact. They're projecting inflation to come down next year from this year. So I, I again, I feel like we just it's going to be very hard to set an NPR growth rate um, that is makes sense for every single hospital. Having a blanket NPR growth rate that's going to make sense for every single hospital, uh, I don't think is the appropriate approach this year. So my sense would be to allow hospitals to submit the budgets that they think that they need based on what they're seeing in their hospital. And then we evaluate, as we always do on a case-by-case -case basis, um, what we think makes sense, given all of the information that we're going to be taking in and their estimates. Um, so that's kind of where I, I still fall with that, although I really appreciate the efforts to try and put some numbers around what might be expected. Um, I really like the, the section on the factors considered, you know, to be considered during the review. Um, I think that's really helpful. I would add uh, and under the population or demographic data, I would add patient migration data, the market share data that, that is referenced later on. I think just specifically calling that out would be helpful. Um, I also would cross off hospital reimbursement variation data cost and cost coverage is great. I would cross off the from hospital sustainability uh, because I think we, you know, hopefully that data is going to be updated. The hospital sustainability efforts were from 2019. So I think that the analytics team is going to be updating it. I guess I wouldn't tie it to hospital sustainability. I think it, you know, going forward, we should always be looking at hospital reimbursement cost and cost coverage data. So I guess I would just strike the hospital sustainability part of that phrase. Um, I agree with Robin on sustainability planning, and and um, I like that suggestion under the executive summary section. I would actually also like to add in that executive summary. Uh, where you say, including any information, the GMCB should know about programmatic changes such as staffing and operational changes. I'd like to be explicit there and ask for any 
service line changes, if a hospital is divesting or adding a service, I think that would be helpful to know right up front. Um, so I would just be explicit about that there. And let me see, in the charge request, um, we can talk about that table if you want in a second, um, but under B, um, where it says describe how the charge request affects the area of service, for example, inpatient, outpatient, et cetera, I guess I would just say, let's be explicit. It should be definitely inpatient, outpatient, and professional. I think we want to know how that charge request will translate to each of those three areas. Um, and then similarly under D, uh, in terms of giving updates to the board about approved change in charge, I would like to see those updates by inpatient, outpatient, and professional. So we know what happened within each of those three categories of, of charge. Uh, under operating margin and total margin, under part B, I like this question around how the hospital's budget um, might support or need to support other entities outside of the physical hospital. Um, I think we can maybe be a little bit even more explicit. If so, please quantify the subsidy and provide information about the financial performance of the, subsi of, of, of the subsidiary. <laughs> Sorry, subsidy and subsidiary. And I wondered if in equity, um, whether health equity measures needed some clarification. So I don't know if that's too general. Um, or if there's any way to define what we mean by health equity measures. This is why I was a little bit curious about from the Clover presentation about, you know, health equity benchmarks. How are we measuring health equity? So wondered what that might look like. And sorry, I'm going to keep going, but you, you all can stop me if you if you have any, if I'm not making sense. Um, in the supplemental data monitoring, I was curious about what the key service lines would be, um, how that was going to be determined. And I was really happy to hear from Jeff um, about the patient migration, because I was going to suggest that we actually pull in that patient migration data specifically to find out what percentage of residents in a community are seeking care in their home hospital. If not, where are they seeking care? Um, being very specific about trying to understand that. So it sounds like that's already in I, but I just wanted to make sure that that was the case. And then if you, I can stop there. That's a lot, I know. Um, I can stop there if there, if anybody needs clarification on anything I said, and then I was just gonna suggest we go to that one inflation slide. Patrick, does that, what I said make sense or do I, should I clarify any of what I said? I think I've got it all and we can follow up with you offline okay. if we have clarifications. Great. Um, so I guess what I just wanted to point out about this table here is, so if you look at the first um, line, there's a 2% increase in wages. It's a $500,000 increase, but it's a 2% increase on wages and wages as a part of the operating expense budget is 60%. I think that's right. It's weighting that 2% over a very large proportion of the expense budget. I think the, the percentages that fall below that line from this example, uh, those percentages were calculated on the $9 million increase. So for example, if you take the uh, you know one million dollars for contract staffing. That's eleven percent. That eleven percent is not the percent of their overall expense budget. It's their percent of you know it's one million over the nine million. So the way that um, this was calculated is not actually matching what the example is on the top. You're not. We're not asking for the percentage, the category percentage of the increase, the dollar increase in expenses, we're looking for the category percentage of the total operating expense budget. Right, so you can see, for example, like the 500,000 uh, is a very small component of say that 9 million. It's not, you know, 60, per, it, it's, it's not gonna be, um, we're not looking for what is the, the dollar increase and the percentage of that dollar increase. We're looking for a, a way to weight 
each of the percentage increases in uh, category by the weight, you know, by the percentage. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm making my sense here clear to my, I'm not making myself clear here, but that category should be the percent of the total operating expense budget, not the delta on how much their expenses have grown. Does that make sense, Patrick and others on the team? So I just, I think we can give an example that makes that clearer and I'm happy to help. Sorry, I was on mute. Yes, that makes sense. And I will reach out to you after the meeting today. OK, great. Thank you. That is all I have, but feel free to if, if anything didn't make sense, I'm happy to. OK, is there other board comments or questions? Uh, this is, yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, quickly on the wait times. Um, some past experience with work at the VA, um, there is no perfect measure, right? And so it's it's a good idea to think about having an assessment of wait times from multiple perspectives. In the um, in the presentation seen earlier this year, um, they used the secret shopper patient surveys claims data. Um, so in addition to what we want hospitals to report to us, I think we ought to consider um, additional measures from additional perspectives. That may include patient surveys, may include patient claims data, um, but we won't, we won't find one, history has shown, we won't find um, a measure that is suitable for everybody. They all have weaknesses. That's all. Thank you. Thanks for all the work um, in this to Patrick and, and team. Okay, other board comments or questions? I know I just want to back up uh, a few points that were made by some of my colleagues, especially on the uh, wait times. I think that uh, we have to be very specific on what we're, we're asking for and um, a lot was learned during um, the work that was done jointly with AHS and DFR, and I think that Board Member Holmes has the, the, the right metrics for what we need to measure. And of course, if so much is going to be driven um, as far as increases based on um, workforce uh, cost, I think that those are entirely appropriate questions as we we're going to need those answers no matter what. So uh, just want to back those up. And uh, again, like the rest of my colleagues, I'd like to uh, thank the uh, team. Although I do disagree with the team's recommendation about setting a um, rate on the NPR, um, I just feel that these have been so uncertain times and the impacts on of the pandemic have affected each hospital so differently that having one number in my mind i just think it's a mistake and i think that uh, um, we need to listen very carefully to each hospital and the story that they tell about what they're seeing what they've experienced and what they hope to achieve in the next year um, rather than trying to use any type of cookie cutter approach. So um, those are my thoughts. Anything else from board members, comments or questions? If not, I'll open it up to public comment. Does any member of the public wish to comment on um, today's discussion and I see Eric Schulteis. Eric. Are you there, Eric? <laughs> well, I see a hand up, Eric, but I'm not hearing you. So well, maybe Eric, while you're trying to figure out why we can't hear you, I'll turn to Walter Carpenter. 
Thanks, Kevin. Uh, thanks to Jess for bringing up the wait times and her delineation of the wait times. As a patient, I've experienced them. Um, I wonder if another thing to look at is not just the wait times, but why there are so many wait times. And <clears throat> when the hospitals come up to the board later on wanting big fee increases, which they probably will to pay for the traveling nurses because the other ones have left for whatever reasons. We've got to look at really the bottom why that's happening and remember that all those costs are paid for by us. The wait times are systematic. They're embedded in the system. I don't think it's you know, whether it's <clears throat> referrals or not, it's all part of the problems of the system itself. Thank you, Walter. Um, Eric, have you had a chance to figure out the uh, technical issues or are you with us? Eric Schulteis from the Healthcare Advocate. Okay, we'll keep moving on. And Eric, just raise your hand again if uh, you actually do wish to uh, speak, or if anybody else from uh, the healthcare advocate uh, might be able to um, figure out what's uh, going on there. So next, I'm going to turn to Mike Del Treco from the Vermont Hospital Association. Mike. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Mullen and board members, and Patrick and your team. Uh, thanks for a thorough presentation. Um, I tried to write as fast as I could the notes from Robin and Jessica, but you you guys talk way faster than I can write. So um, uh, I, I think there's a lot here. Um, I did spend some time with Patrick reviewing the uh, the documents. I, I was not going to comment, but I didn't want anybody to think my lack of commenting was a, a vote of approval. So I'm saying I'm, what I'm saying here is I've I'll I'll review these things. I know Patrick is meeting with uh, hospital CFOs on uh, March 22nd. I think we'll have a better handle on uh, providing some some more uh, constructive feedback uh, at that point as well. So uh, thanks, uh, Chair, and I appreciate your help. And Patrick, thank you for all the uh, time you've provided in the past. Thank you, Mike. And uh, um, I see that there are a number of hospital uh, CFOs uh, on this call and any feedback that you can get, the sooner that uh, Patrick gets it, the better off we all are. So Sure, sure. Uh, one other comment on the uh, uh, S-285, is it right? Um, I, I think there's, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty of what's going to happen, how things are going to roll out. And I know that we're looking for specificity on how we participate. I know the uh, chief medical officers, officers group that we have has been sort of talking about, you know, moving forward in the next steps. And uh, certainly as this evolves, there they'll be uh, plugging into to this um, to this dialogue. What that looks like, I I, I wish I could tell you, um, but that's that's what I would offer in that space. We truly appreciate that, Mike. As you know, we're all going to have to be at the table for that yep. discussion. Thank you. Is there other public comment? Is there other public comment? I do feel bad that uh, Eric had had his hand raised and we didn't get to hear from him. So um, if anybody's uh, listening from the healthcare advocate, if you could just uh, um, let Eric know that uh, we're really looking forward to hearing what he had to say, and uh, perhaps he could uh, send any comments in writing, and we'll post that to the uh, website. Thank you, so Chair Mullen. This is Sam. Um, just working with some tech issues, but yeah, I'll let Eric know. Thanks a lot. Appreciate that, Sam. One last call for public comment. Is there any other public comment? If not, keep in mind that uh, the board does have an open public comment period through at least um, Monday the 21st and likely longer. Um, but the quicker that um, the team gets the comments, the much more um, time that they have for carefully digesting them and trying to factor them into 
um, recommendations for guidance that will be discussed at next week's board meeting. So again, uh, I plead with everyone to get comments back as quickly as possible. Um, Mike, did your hand go back up again or is that still from earlier? It, it did, um, and I was just looking at my, my notes and um, I wanted to comment on um, one of the questions that Robin had around uh, specifically the cost center piece. Um, there was some uh, a fair amount of dialogue around that um, and it was it started from the point of view of um, how our revenues sort of allocated uh, to value based performance and we had a conversation that said you know it's it's sort of like um, when you get paid you deposit your your check in your uh, savings account and then you spend things on your expenses um, so that's where it sort of moved to a cost center look if there is something that you're looking to be more holistically um, yeah that might not do it but that's why the, that word cost center came in because it's if your uh, ie care coordination department it grew if you were um, uh, and how did it grow and, and what are the things that happen in there it's more identifiable from a from that point perspective than from a revenue perspective so just just some feedback on your comments thanks mike no that makes sense i was just wondering if it would then miss things like the hospital had in kind uh staffing for the community health team and you know it may not be dollars that you can necessarily carve out like a department but it's efforts that they're making that supports um you know healthcare reform so i i mean, I, I mean if it works for you guys that's fine i just wanted to to kind of express that so we weren't missing information yeah, I think it could. I think that I would have to look at the language spe specifically, but I think it's general enough. And if it's not general enough to catch it, maybe there's something that beyond, you know, your normal expenses. What else have you done? Like something like that. But that's that's how it, that's how it got moved to expense or cost center space. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Is there other public comment? Hearing none, it's been a great discussion today. I look forward to, uh, oh, did I see a hand go up? No, it has disappeared again. So um, again, it's been a great discussion today. I look forward to uh, further discussion next Wednesday, and hopefully we can start um, working through all the different uh, issues that are going to have to be um, discussed. And so um, thank you, Patrick and team. And um, Eric, I see that you are alive. Um, did you want to jump in today? I'm sorry, I did. I'm sorry for the delay. I, I, I apparently have made it all through the pandemic, not having Teams issues except for right now. So apologies. Um, Tremlin, I guess I... Aside from, so we will provide comments on the budget guidance. Um, you know, we received it yesterday at 311. So it's not that it's missing. It was just asked for. Um, I think that uh, mode of interaction was from early, from the pandemic times. I don't know if it's appropriate as we come out of the pandemic. And I don't, think it's something we've agreed to. So Vaz was a integral part in my understanding of developing this guidance. Um, so I think that's something we have to revisit. We do have good um, examples of interaction with other staff teams. Um, so for instance, the ACO team, and my hope would be that we could have that level of meaningful engagement uh, in the hospital budget process and the guidance development. Um, I have some concerns uh, that haven't necessarily been expressed, so they have in part about the use of inflation to come up with the staff recommendation for the NPR growth and not to beat a dead horse, but um, I think there are some issues around, that I'd like to see around sensitivity of the time frame selected. So there are seven pre-COVID timeframes and six 
COVID timeframes, um, the earliest year has the lowest uh, or second, third lowest rate of growth. So that's going to pull down the average or the calculation and make the difference look larger. I would be interested um, in seeing some sensitivity analysis around the time frame and how that might change their um, recommendation. I also want to point out that um, it may be the best we have, but the CPI for medical services is a national number. Um, there may not be Vermont specific numbers. Um, for some of those numbers, um, there might be regional numbers. Of course, Boston has an outsized uh, influence on that. I think uh, it might behoove uh, the hospital budget team to communicate um, with the statisticians at the Vermont Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, in the past, I found them exceedingly helpful and they're also trained specifically in looking at uh, wage data, inflation data. They are contracted with the Federal Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, so I just wanna point out there are various reasons that um, can be moved in a certain way, that methodology to produce exceedingly high numbers. Um, and unfortunately, I didn't see the sensitivity around how they came at that. I think also they, you know, the prediction that inflation last six months will just continue in the future. To me, that reads as a naive prediction. 2% um, is an exceedingly high, especially for uh, what is it, PPI, um, historically, that would be amongst the highest rate of growth. So um, I have some skepticism about the prediction. Of course, we can't predict things perfectly, but to me, it doesn't even read as reasonably the best we can do. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. And I want to apologize up front. I'm saddened to hear that uh... You weren't part of the uh, discussion. To me, if the regulated entity is at the table, so should you. And so um, we'll have those internal discussions here at the board, but I want to apologize to you. Thank you. Mr. Chair, may I speak on that, please? Certainly. We did reach out uh, several weeks back uh, to inform them that this process had been started, so the opportunity was there for engagement all along. Uh, however, as we're bringing on a couple of new staff members, uh, we had to focus our attention in other places. And so I think Mike Del Treco can also speak to that. His involvement was not as in depth this year as it has been either. So the opportunity was there. Um, it wasn't a closed door whatsoever. And I was not implying that they did not meet any time frame of ours because it was missing. They did receive the guidance yesterday afternoon. That is true. Uh, but in no way was I making a statement that um, the HCA did not deliver on expectations. So I just want to clarify that up front. And also, I've been communicating with Mr. Peich. Um, Eric's involvement uh, is something new to me on this level. I did not know that he was going to be our point person for that. So I think we have a communication issue here that we've got to work on. Uh, board Chair, just really quickly. Um, so at Patrick, it's an exceedingly small office. There are three of us working on this stuff effectively. So, you know, someone is lead, but obviously we're all aware. Um, and Sam is relatively new. I will say, I think there are communication issues to work out. I took the email and the rest of the team, I think, did too from several weeks ago is this is how it was gonna happen, not an invitation for engagement. Um, that's good to know moving forward that those are actually invitations for engagement, but that was not at all clear to us. Or to I suggest you. Eric that uh, perhaps you and I and Patrick sit down and have a conversation. And That would be wonderful. Because I think that we're all hoping for the same thing, but I think right now, um, we may be talking past each other, so let's uh, 
we hear you. And uh, again, I apologize. Thank you. OK, with that, I want to uh, thank uh, everyone for the the hard work and effort that went into the presentation today. Again, next Wednesday, we'll come back to this. So at this point in time, is there any old business to come before the board? Is there any new business to come before the board? Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been moved by Member Holmes and seconded by Member Lunge to adjourn. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please signify by saying nay. Thank you everyone and have a great rest of the day.